<clears throat> okay. Mr. Coelho, I apologize for my lateness. I only saw your um, details just then. I was using the, the previous um, dial-in. Well, you actually just told on yourself, Mr. McCoskey, because we didn't know you were late. Oh, well, I apologize. <laughs> That's fine. Good morning to everyone. Um, all right, we have Justice K with us. Uh, this is Civil Appeal Number 3 of 2021. Uh, Gail Ann Ventura's against Clarion Bank Limited. Uh, the appellant, Ms. Ventura's, is represented by Mr. Cameron Hill of Westwater Hill & Co. And the respondent mm -hmm. bank is represented by Mr. Ben McCosker of Walkers Limited. These proceedings are taken before my lords, the president of the Court of Appeals to Christopher Clark, as well as my lord, Justice Kay and Spell. Right. Uh, good morning. Um, there are a number of preliminary questions that we uh, I'd like to deal with um, before we start properly. Uh, the first is the question of timing. Uh, the suggestion has been made that we um, might sit until two o'clock, um, which is five hours from now. Um, we're not very uh, enthused by that idea uh, because we don't believe that it will solve potential problems uh, because we can't possibly sit without any break at all um, and if we don't finish by two o'clock um, it will be necessary to resume uh, we would have thought uh, at some later date so the idea of only sitting until two o'clock uh, may not itself be um, a restriction that we should necessarily impose well, we have it in mind, but subject to any observations to the contrary, um, is that we should proceed in the normal way and see how we go, and if necessary, continue sitting tomorrow. Certainly from the, from the respondent's perspective, um, that's actually perfectly acceptable. L likewise, I'm, I'm grateful. And, and, and I would have been content to... Uh, the matter is not urgent for me, and so I would have probably been able to wait the five or six months that it takes the specialist to come back to the island. But um, I, I, if, we're, if we're going, I, I, I think my client would prefer us to finish today. And if we don't finish, if, we, if it's looking like we're not going to be finished by two in the normal way, then we shall, I shall simply make an alternative arrangement. I think. Uh, we'll see how we go. Okay, well, let's, let, let's, let's see how we go. That's the first item on the program. Uh, secondly, <coughs> thank you for um, the reading lists. Um, I'm bound to say um, that it has um, not been helpful to have the index to the record of appeal uh, and a reference to the tabs uh, given to us at what for me was not three minutes past nine United Kingdom time last night. Uh, the list itself refers to bundles one and two, which I found confusing because they're not, as I had originally thought them to be, the same as volumes one and two. Um, uh, in the reading list uh, provided by the uh, appellant, I have um, read through, sometimes skimmed, um, the uh, particular items um, and um, in particular, when time was limited, as it was, I have simply reviewed the suggested paragraphs. I think I got or found, not wholly without difficulty, all the documents in the list, with the exception of the appellant's list of documents, um, which it seems to me it's not necessary to look at at all, and which was referred to as attached, but so far as I was concerned, wasn't. Um, and uh, in item 15, uh, there was a reference to various items of correspondence, including two pages inter alia. I have looked at the two pages, but in the absence of any assistance, I have not looked at whatever inter alia um, uh, might cover. Next item on the program, um, then there is not actually in the record 
though I have in part been able to obtain uh, copies of the documents from some other source, um, a number of documents which would normally be there. Um, the first is the, uh, they may have been in front of Justice Bell on a previous occasion, but this is a different court um, and they ought to be before us. Uh, I have not been able to find in the record, firstly, the original order of the registrar, a failure to comply with which gives rise to the need to apply to withdraw, uh, nor have I been able to find the original application under Order 5 Rule 1, asking for a waiver of the rules, nor the order under Order 2 Rule 17, dismissing the appeal, uh, nor the restoration application under Order 2 Rule 17.4, of which I have not been able to find a copy, nor what, what's been described as the Appeals Directions Relief application and the Poor Person application. I have got copies of the, la of the last two, but they are uh, not, so far as I can see, in the record. And it seems to me that we do need to have, <coughs> before the um, judgment is delivered, the documents to which I have referred. There's also a reference um, at the end of Miss Venturis's affidavit to having uh, obtained finance to obtain two days of transcript. Um, I assume that they were obtained, but if they were obtained, we haven't got them. Uh, so the documentation is not in apple pie order. Um, if I can take that, I think in bite-sized chunks. The various applications which are before your lordships this morning have been filed electronically, I believe, in, in the first instance, because the courts were shut because we had a lockdown a few uh, weeks ago, and the 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 initial the, the initial hearing before my lord. Bell took place um, with an electronic copy of the affidavit and um, only the notice of motion dealing with the application under Order 5, Rule 1, which uh, I, I gather the, the disposition was that it was adjourned. Uh, his Lordship was not prepared to make an order on the present state of the, his, of, of the preparedness of the papers. Well, that's, that's not quite right, Mr. Hill. Uh, essentially, the grounds for the application un, under Order 5, Rule 1 um, uh, were um, an application which had not been made under Order 2, Rule 33. Um, that, that was what was urged before me as the reason why your client should be excused from the obligations of Order 5, Rule 1. I said I wasn't prepared to deal with that without having... Uh, a proper application filed and an opportunity to uh, um, review the papers in what was clearly a relatively complex matter. Okay, but, but that, that's helpful because I, I wasn't entirely, um, the, 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 the precise dis disposition was not something I fully understood either. And I'm grateful to your Lordship for, for, for making that clear to me. So, the, so what happened was that the electronic uh, affidavit that had been filed was then um, added to, and is still called the first affidavit of, of Gail Adventures, and formally sworn at the same time as an application was filed under Order Thirty, uh, under the under the rule relative to the poor person. I think it's Order Rule Thirty Three of Order Two. Uh, in the interim, the application had been made that the matter be dismissed administratively under order 17 and so an application had to be made as well to restore and so the, the, the first of those two applications was made pursuant to, to my, my lord bell's 
uh, indication that he wished to see a formal application under Order 33. Order 2, Rule 33. Order 2, Rule 33. And then because of the passage of time, the, 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 when, the, when the Rules 9 and 10 have not been complied with, it, there appears not to be a discretion in the courts. It's simply if the registrar certifies that they have not hmm. been complied with, then the case is dismissed administratively. And so the, those three applications all, were all filed, as I say, electronically. I, I, I'm not sure hard copies were ever circulated amongst the parties, but that is how that came to be. And then the formal, the formal affidavit, which is the only affidavit, was added to, to take account of my Lord Bell's explicit request to deal with order thir Rule 33 uh, on, on a separate application. And then the, the question of the administrative that's how the three Let us not spend too much time on this now, but even if the matter was filed electronically, there must be an electronic copy of it. That, that I, I, that I am in the position that with the exception of the two matters that I have mentioned, I do not have a hard copy, an electronic copy, or any form of copy of the, of the orders and applications in question. Very well. Between myself and Mr. McCosker and Mr. Quayle, I'm sure we can get our hands on all of the documents. Yeah, the, yeah the, let's not spend time on it now, um, but it is quite odd um, not having the order you're um, seeking to have set aside in front of the, the tribunal in which you're inviting that to be done. Right. Right. And what about the transcript? The transcripts have not been done. Uh, the transcripts have been ordered, but they haven't been paid for. Uh, you will notice in the very last paragraph of Mrs. Venter's affidavit, she says that she has an acquaintance who will pay for them. Uh, that acquaintance uh, happens to be me. Uh, and if this application is successful, then they will be provided for the hearing that would take place on the appeal. And how much does the transcript cost, Mr. Hill? About $3,000, my lord. Wouldn't it be better to spend that money towards providing security and getting the appeal in order? Well, it, it, uh, it, it, does, ask, it does ask for both. Um, I, it, that, would, that would require me to pay $8,000 for my clients, and I'm, whilst I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to be as helpful as I, I can. Can't, I can't think that it will be particularly helpful for us to have a transcript. I, I don't think it'll be helpful to have the transcript either, but uh, Mr. McCosker insisted it will. If, 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 uh, if Mr. McCosker will forego the transcript at the hearing, I will pay the $5,000. But he's been insistent that we have it. And I, I, I appreciate that that makes for an enormous waste of time, but uh, I will advance to my client the security if we can forego a transcript. I can't afford both. So that makes the application under Order 2, Rule 33 academic, doesn't it? It, it would do, but I, 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 I'm, I also saw that there might be some good sense in finding out whether my client has a case in this. Anyway, um, it, I, I don't know. Mr. Mr. McCosker has been insistent that we have the, the, the transcript. He feels that there is something in the transcript that would be, uh, that's essential that we have. I do not see that, uh, as his own case was on the documents, and my case is, that uh, it's the absence of anything on it. It's the absence of evidence that's the problem, uh, that I don't think there is a transcript problem, that we don't need a transcript. I am prepared to advance my client the $5,000 if that, because that, that, that is all that I can afford. Well, Mr. Matosko, why do, why do we need a transcript? My Lord, yes. Uh, the appellant's testimony at trial Ran, the trial ran for some two days. The transcript is, um, I, I think that it would certainly be beneficial for the, for the court to have it. However, the, the direction that my friend is taking is rather places the cart before the horse in the sense that we only get to discussion of whether he may or may not advance funds for a, for a transcript after he has satisfied your lordships that, that this appeal should be restored, it having already been dismissed, which will require him to recover. It has a reasonable probability of success. So without wanting to delay matters at this early stage in today's hearing, um, perhaps the question of, of whether 
a transcript ought to be produced should be dealt with after my friend has advanced his application to restore his appeal. I mean, speaking for myself, it appeared to me that the transcript would only be of use um, <clears throat> on the material as I presently understand it, in that it might um, make clear what exactly the learned judge had been Chief Justice had been asked to decide and what he had decided. But I mean, it may be that we don't need it for that purpose. I, I suppose, uh, my Lord, that the, uh, and, and when my friend gets into the meat of his submissions, I'm sure that this will um, be dealt with, but the allegation that a certain document was uh, produced at the last minute, uh, the, the admissibility of that document was dealt with rather extensively before his Lordship. Uh, and if this were to go to an actual appeal, were you minded to restore the appeal, uh, it, it might be of value to, uh, to this court to understand the Chief Justice's deliberations, uh, as, is, as is usually the course. Uh, of course, the order for the transcript is the conventional order. It was made at the directions hearing, and the, uh, the registrar, uh, because Mr Hill was not in attendance at that hearing, between the registrar and myself, we agreed that uh, liberty to apply be part of that order. So if Mr. Hill had an issue with the transcript, I would have expected uh, him to make an application to the registrar rather than this late in the day. Mm -hmm. um, did well, okay. Seems to be a perfect example of how not to run a railway. Um, the, did the Chief Justice make a ruling as to the admissibility of um, what I would presume you're referring to as uh, meaning the asset transfer agreement. No, my Lord. Uh, I, I actually, and this is why sometimes transcripts are important, because uh, you have to rely on counsel's recollection, which is imperfect. My recollection is that it was a preliminary objection was taken by my friend to this document. We then had to rehearse uh, before his Lordship where the document appears in the witness statement, the circumstances on which it was made available seven months before the trial. And in the end, as you'll um, as your Lordships will perceive from his ruling, uh, the, the Chief Justice did deal with the, with the document. Um, so whether th there's an express ruling as to admissibility, I, I, I certainly, my recollection is that uh, he did rule it admissible. He had a reference to the document. Submissions were made by counsel in relation to the document, which is why uh, it is mentioned in the ruling. Well, wait a moment. When you say he did rule it as admissible, do you mean that there is something separate from the judgment in which he gave a ruling on the admissibility of the agreement? Not, or not at all. Say, sorry? No, my Lord. No. So when you say he ruled it as admissible, you say that's apparent from the fact that he referred to it in the judgment. That's as far as I can take it, my Lord. Yes, the, 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 the issue was, was, was debated before him and, and ultimately yeah. he... Okay. And the, reason, right. the reason he made no ruling is because my learned friend indicated that I was misguided that it had been disclosed and that he would provide the evidence of the same after lunch. And for whatever reason, it was never dealt with further beyond that. And it, um, this, 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 this idea that it was my, my obligation to collect a witness statement that contained a document that had not appeared in a list so that I could discover it is really not how discovery takes place. Well, wait a moment. Right. Sorry, I'm getting completely lost. As I have understood it, the agreement we're all talking about was exhibited to an affidavit in June of 2020. It was exhibited, yes. That, that's correct, and, and, and not to interrupt, but not only was it exhibited to the affidavit which was signed in June, but as I'll take you to eventually, once, once my friend gets on with his application, um, the respondent or the, the, the plaintiff at the time had proposed to exchange witness statements at the end of February, seven months before the trial, the only reason why my friend is so aggrieved by the late appearance of this document is because the appellant never complied with the orders of the court. And in, in the event, the appellant never filed a witness statement. So this document was in evidence in the sense that it was not in a list of documents, and I'll address that in due course, but it was ready to be provided to the appellant at the beginning of March 2020. Yeah, okay, well, we better wait for and, uh, and just so we have that, because it's quite an important point. And the appellant is criticized for not knowing about the, doc the document mm -hmm. because she didn't. But wait a minute, wait a minute, Let, leave aside all about, all, uh, on any view, the document was A, known about, B, produced 
in the affidavit of June 2020. Yes, my lord. No, sorry, I'm looking at Mr. Hill. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's right, is it, Mr. Hill? Yes, its first appearance is in the witness statement of Mr. Fiala. Yes, in June which, 2020. Which I, well, which I received on the, on the eve of trial. Why? Why? <laughs> because that was the, that, that was the, I, I, it, uh, I'm, I'm not sure because I indicated I would, would not be filing a witness statement uh, some weeks before, but I, I received it very late. The witness statement was the witness statement of Mr. Fiala was withheld until Mrs. Ventures filed her witness statement. She eventually elected to rely on the affidavit which she'd filed previously. And so the witness statement was provided to me uh, on the eve of trial. And when did she it was never indicated to me that it contained documents that had not been disclosed in the list of documents. When did she elect to uh, rely on her earlier affidavit? About a month previously. Pre prior to trial? Yes. And when was that um, election communicated to Mr. McCosker? Uh, about a month previously. My lords, that's, that's not agreed and I can address it in, 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 in my submissions in the main. But my main submission is will be that the inclusion of that document in a witness statement without any uh, indication to anybody that it was in the witness statement, it existed, is not sufficient. And indeed, in June of... So are you saying uh, that if you've been given the witness statement six months before, uh, that would be not be sufficient to call it to your attention? Yes, that, that would have been sufficient, but I wasn't given it six months before. Yeah, I know. But, but you can't say uh, um, simply putting it in, in the witness statement uh, isn't enough. If you've got the witness statement, it's there for you to read. Yes. But I didn't have the witness statement. I know that. But well, you, appear to be, you appear to be making two points. A, you didn't have the witness statement until too late and B, that it was no good putting it in the witness statement anyway. Correct. Why? Because it needed to be on the list. It needed to be inspected. Uh, we did a physical inspection of all the documents. We inspected all of the originals. But if, if the you had... Is not, the document is not pleaded. If you had looked at the witness statement at an earlier stage and apprehended that the document that was exhibited was not in the list, it could have been yes. dealt with um, at that point, I mean, you um, approaching your submissions, the subject of discovery, as if there's only ever one list filed and everybody gets it right first time. That's not the way it happens in real life. No, and that's not, in actual fact, on, in June of 2020, uh, Mr. McCosker stood before the, uh, the Chief Justice and said that the obligations under Order 24 had been complied with. Well, they yes. hadn't been. Because the obligations are the and, and, we, and we know that. The, and, and the cases to which I'm going to take your lordship says that when you discover a document late, you make an application to file a supplemental list of documents. Uh, when that document is important, it may have an effect on the pleadings. It may have an effect on the attitude of the defendant or the plaintiff, as the case may be, uh, on, their, on their defenses. This document is not some peripheral document. This is the principal document upon which they rely. And uh, it was well, not given to my client, nor was it in, in view of the case made. that you raise, yes. But it's a document which, if you'd have um, proceeded appropriately at the time that witness statements were exchanged, you, you would have uh, come across and, and appreciated that it was not in the list of documents, but it would have been available to you months before trial. Well, hang on, I, I, I might have noticed it. It may well be that my researchers going through the affidavit uh, missed it. It was included in a, some 400 page exhibit. It was also included specifically and summarized in a much shorter affidavit, which anybody looking at the affidavit could scarcely have missed. In the witness statement. In the witness statement, sorry. Witness yes. Statement, whatever. yes, but I didn't have that witness statement, as I say. Well, I, that's, the, sorry, that's coming back to the timing point. We'll yes, come that's back. okay. I, I, I just... Well, what, I, what I'm indicating to you is a certain lack of enthusiasm for the proposition that even though the document had been A, referred to in the witness statement, and B, exhibited, uh, it couldn't have any effect unless it had also been listed. 
and gone through the process of disclosure and discovery and all that, yes. Well, I'm sorry, what process of disclosure and discovery? And inspection and so on. Okay, inspection. Have you seen the, the document? I've seen a copy of it. I haven't seen the original. We asked to see the original of all the others. Did not your client attend shortly before trial and inspect? It wasn't in that, uh, it wasn't in the inspection. It wasn't included in the documents that we inspected. Right. Okay. It wasn't included in the documents which we inspected at the vaults of the bank. Well, have you asked to see the original? We haven't yet, no. Uh, you haven't? We asked, to, we asked to see the original of all the documents that were on the list. Yes. Have you asked to see the original of the ATA of which you have seen a copy? Uh, not today, no. No, either today or before today? Not, not, no, we haven't. No, okay. But we, we didn't, its importance was not, in, it was not clear until after judgment had been... Yes, I got, I've, I've, got, I've got that. Right. Okay, well, we've taken things slightly out of order. Let's, let's go back to you, Mr. Hill. Um, well, very well, I'll, I'll, I'll begin if I might. Um, yes, please do. This, this um, what, we are, what we are dealing with uh, here is a transaction between First Bermuda Group Limited, who was my client's mortgagee bank, and what was then called Capital G and is now called Clarion Bank. That transaction occurred, and I, I won't take through all of the documents as we go, but that transaction occurred by first there being an amalgamation between First Bermuda Group and a subsidiary of uh, Clarion, uh, that mechanism is used in Bermuda to avoid the consequences of stamp duty. And then the amalgamated subsidiary uh, entered into a number of transactions with its parent company, uh, principally an assignment, uh, a deed of assignment and a and a deal of confirmation. The pleadings, if we turn them up firstly, show how the matter was pleaded between the parties. And if we look uh, firstly at the affidavit of Patrice James, which is it in the originating summons at tab two, I believe. Could you give me the uh, page number of the record, Mr. Hill? Uh, page seven. No, 73. Mr. Hill, the justices are operating from the consolidated version of the record of appeal, which was sent to counsel. So you would have to use the page references, which are in red at the bottom. Okay, very well, page 73. That's second affidavit of Patrice James. No, I need mean the first affidavit. I was right. It was page, tab two, page seven. My lords, it's page 52 of the record. Thank you, Mr. McCosker. Thank goodness. Yes. And in that... I believe you should give me a moment. I'm maybe falling apart here. Yeah. 
I, I apologize. The document that I require is the reply, which is at page uh, 28, 27 and 28 of the record, of the red, of the, of the, of the record. I will go through it in the order, in this order rather than the order in which it appears. Reply and defense to counterclaim. Yes, that's, that's correct. And I, paragraph five, which is at page 28, is how I, where I wish to start. And she, she tells us how, what, what, how they say the transaction occurred. And they say that as regards paragraph two, three, and seven, and we'll go there in a moment of the defense and counterclaim, the plaintiff and first Bermuda group entered into a deed of assignment dated 30th of September. The deed of assignment will be referred to at trial for its full terms and effect. And by virtue of the deed of assignment, First Bermuda unconditionally, irrevocably, and absolutely assigned all of its right, title, and interest and benefit to the mortgage, to the, to the plaintiff. The plaintiff and First Bermuda subsequently entered into a deed of confirmation. Dated 5th of September, the deed of confirmation will be referred to at trial for its full terms and effect. And the deed of confirmation confirmed, with the avoidance of doubt, the freehold in respect of the property was conveyed uh, to the plaintiff. And in respect of paragraph six and eight of the defense, defendant was served with formal notice of her default under the loan. The document to which that pleads is at tab three. And here is what is set up. Uh, Mr. Hill, can we please um, go to the page number of the record of appeal when, rather than referring to tabs? Okay. I only 13. have the record of appeal electronically before me. The page 13, my lord. 13? Yes. And here we have, this is, this is what Ms. Vetcher says. First Bermuda Group Limited is a company organized under the laws of Bermuda and had, at the relevant time, its registered office and so on. And then she says, at paragraph three, it is said, which is not admitted, that First Bermuda Group Limited thereafter amalgamated with Capital G Holdings Limited. The surviving company following that amalgamation is said to be First Bermuda Group, uh, the subsidiary. Thereafter, it is alleged that the rights and obligation of First Bermuda Group Limited were assigned to the plaintiff by deed of assignment. The plaintiff has put to strict proof of the validity, scope, and effect of these transactions insofar as they are said to vest in the plaintiff any right with respect to the deed of assignment. So the issue, the question and issue between the parties is whether or not there has been a valid transfer of the rights contained in the mortgage from First Bermuda Group to the plaintiff uh, or to the plaintiff in these proceedings. It is the documents relied on, as we've just seen, as given rise to those rights are the deed of assignment and the deed of confirmation and the ex no reliance is placed upon the asset transfer agreement. Can we just pause there for a moment? You're quite right that no reliance is placed uh, in the pleading on the asset transfer um, agreement. Um, but in a sense, why does that matter? Uh, your client owed a debt in the amount of the loan under the mortgage. Yes. And the mortgage was assigned. And if and insofar as there was something wrong with the first assignment, it was confirmed by the deed of confirmation. The plaintiff would be entitled to recover even if nobody ever saw the ATA. The 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 the, the, the assignment. Could you, could you answer that question? Um, is that right, Mr. Hill? Uh, no. Why? It, it's not because the deed of assignment deals with legal interests, and these these the the plaintiff has abandoned their claim to a legal interest and relies entirely on an equitable mortgage. And the, neither the assignment nor the deed of confirmation deal with equitable interests. The uh, asset transfer agreement is essential to their claim. 
because, and in fact, the deed of confirmation only confirms that it had effect of transferring the freehold uh, legal interest. So the deed of assignment does not cover the interests that are being uh, alleged uh, because at the, at the last minute, the legal claims were abandoned and only the claim to an equitable mortgage was pursued. And at no point in either the assignment or the deed of confirmation is there any uh, assignment of the legal, of the equitable uh, interests, which would be, which would the equitable mortgage would, would give rise to. And if I'm right, the equitable mortgage shouldn't be allowed to stand in any event because the only reason it was required was because the plaintiff itself wrongfully uh, withheld the deed of reconveyance, then the only thing they would have would be the debt. And that debt would require the asset transfer agreement to be transferred from the First Bermuda Group to the plaintiff. I'm not following that. The, if you look at the mortgage, it contains a promise to pay the debt. Yes. And that is, and not, is, that is not covered by the assignment. Why not? Because the assignment deals with the legal interests and the promise to pay the, the because there was, well, it doesn't cover the security in any event. Forget about the security. Well, the security is what they're claiming today. Right to possession. Mm -hmm. Right. But the, the asset transfer is essential to their claim. Yes, I, I quite follow that for, for the claim to possession. But for the claim to the debt, they don't need to claim a security interest. No. So they've got a claim under the loan anyway. Uh, they, yes. Right. The debt, the debt is owed, and whether or not it was effectively transferred is, um, and, well, and what the security is behind it. Well, those are two different questions. A, the yes, transfer they are. of the debt. They are. And, I accept that, my lord. Yes, and B, the transfer of the loan. But it seems to me, as at present, that there was undoubtedly a transfer of the debt. Yes. So that your client owes the debt. Well, the assignment was held to be invalid by um, the Chief Justice. Yes, but confirmed by the deed of confirmation. The deed of confirmation confirms that it transferred the legal interest. Yes. The, the deed of confirmation confirms that it was intended by the assignment to transfer legal title. And that, yes. in my submission, would not be sufficient to uh, resurrect the uh, transfer by the assignment of the shows. The shows in action, which is a loan. Oh, the precise see. wording of the confirmation, as read with the defective assignment, would not save the claim to the assignment of the debt. Mm -hmm. Now, um, th this transaction has been a dog's dinner from the very outset. Now, my learned friend's firm was not involved, but um, we are dealing here with the transfer of obligations and rights uh, of, a, of a bank. Um, the complexity of such a transaction um, doesn't really bear thinking about. And the notion that it was achieved by two two-page documents or three-page documents containing two clauses is um, difficult to, to fathom really. Uh, it said that the it said that the asset transfer agreement or the, had the effect of transferring the obligations to repay the depositors when it does no such thing. How the depositors' uh, rights were were conveyed is not clear. The Bermuda Monetary Authority, uh, which regulates the operation of banks usually takes an interest in these sorts of things, and I'm, it's not clear how the Bermuda Monetary Authority viewed this. What ended up occurring was, in fact, the mixing of the assets and liabilities of, well, the assets, really, of uh, First Bermuda Group with those of Capital G, uh, Clarion, as they're now called, and um, that appears to have been catastrophic for them as well, because they are now under new ownership who have had to inject significant capital.
And what we say is that banks are special animals. And a couple of transactions took place. And its assets should have been, and the assets of capital G should have been isolated from each other. And the amalgamation should never have been allowed to occur at all. And the proper mechanism for protecting the depositors and mortgagors of an insolvent bank should have been triggered. And uh, well, why, why, Mr. Hill, does the protection of the depositors um, concern us in this case? My, my client was a depositor. Well, she was a mortgagor. But, should, but she was a depositor as well. The, but she doesn't, she doesn't uh, claim any relief in her position no. as depositor, does she? No, but she does, she does, she does assert that so, the so court should not lend why, its authority to a transaction that had the effect of instantly bankrupting her mortgagor. Her position, her position as depositor, surely, is irrelevant to the issues in these proceedings. It, it is. What, what the, the, the main, the the main issue is whether this court should lend its support to a transaction or whether it should be the... the to a transaction which, to which the parties uh, that entered into it have no complaint at all, uh, but your client, who was not a party, makes objection. We, but the, the, because of the nature of banks and their obligations and rights, there are third party interests which are at stake and about which we know nothing about whether or not how the, how the effect of this transaction will turn out for the depositors. But those are not issues before us, are they, Mr. Hill? Well, they are in the sense that that is, that is what, that if the transaction had the effect of, uh, as, a, as the learned Chief Justice said himself, if I am right, that on a construction of these documents, the, the transfers concerned only the assets of First Bermuda Group, leaving its debts behind, then this court should not lend its support to such a, to such a transaction. And what should happen is, the insolvent bank should have gone through the correct procedure for, as, as happened, we saw it ourselves in the financial crisis, what happened with Merrill Lynch when Bank of America was obliged to take I've seen bank. all of that, Mr. Hill. Don't let's confuse uh, the, the facts of this case with the financial crisis and other parties who have no relevance to this case at all. Well, they're instructive, my lord. They're not. We will have to disagree on that. The banks are particular animals and they are regulated in a particular way. And that regulation ought not to be avoided um, by a transaction of this kind carried out in secret because the clients of Capital G were told that the amalgamation would occur and nothing would happen with their, with their accounts and everything would remain the same. So that's, that's exactly what you would expect when a mortgage portfolio is... Um, passed from one party to another. The, the position is simply that going forward, um, the person who has a mortgage as part of that mortgage portfolio, instead of paying to bank A, pays their mortgage obligation in future to bank B. But she was told that she would continue to pay her obligation to bank A. That's the, that's the issue. The, 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 after the amalgamation, the clients of First Bermuda Group received communication from First Bermuda Group saying we've just amalgamated with these with this lot, but nothing's going to happen to your uh, your mortgage. You will continue to pay first from you to group, you will, and, and so on and so forth. And that was entirely was exactly what my client intended to try to do. Can we look at the document that um, established yes. The amalgamation correspondence document that informed your client that she was to continue to pay First Bermuda? Uh, page 116 of the record. And then the, the, the letter says what it says. Should I leave your lordships to read it? But direct us to that part of the letter that um, supports what you've just said, if you would. Uh, 
um, the frequently asked questions are dealt with at page 118. What does this mean to me as a client is one of the frequently asked questions. As a valued client of Capital G Bank and First Bermuda Group, you will continue to have a relationship with an institution that is backed by strong assets, a solid capital position, and a talented team. Can we find the part that deals with my Lord Justice Kay's question, which, which is, where is it said that your client must continue, despite the amalgamation, to pay her mortgage to First Bermuda Group? It's at page 119, the pre-penultimate question. Well, all of them, all of them imply what I've just said, but uh, and I was coming along to your loan will remain the same subject to the terms of your loan agreement. You should continue to make payments just as you always have. Say, say also... that First Bermuda um, Group will remain intact with the addition of a wholly owned subsidiary of Capital G Bank Limited. Yes. There was no talk of paying Capital G, of it all being assigned. And the debt That's because the assignment hadn't into... taken place then. The assignment didn't take place until September. Correct. So not surprising that a letter in January doesn't refer to an assignment that hadn't taken place. No, and it's, but it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't refer to the, it, it doesn't tell the clients of FED, it tell, what, I, what I say, I don't go any further than saying she was told that everything would remain the same. And that's what she expected. Well, now, everything, everything would changed remain with the assignment. Same. It's true that everything changed with the assignment, but what she was told when the amalgamation took place was that she should continue to play the same people. Right. And there's nothing came along with the, although she was given, I, I, I take from that what it says. It says you, you will continue to pay First Bermuda Group. In answer to the question that I was asked is um, you continue, you, when, when the amalgamation takes place, you can, when Bank A amalgamates with Bank B, you stop paying Bank A and start paying Bank B. I was, my answer to that question was that that's contrary to what my client was told. And this is the evidence for what- But it, wait it, it a moment. You can't interpret this as a promise for eternity. No, 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 my Lord, I was asking, I was simply answering that it was put to me that when there's an amalgamation, the, what the effect of that is, is you stop paying your old bank and start paying the new one. And I, in, in response to that, that, that uh, proposition, I said, that is not okay. what was suggested well, to my client. Yeah. So what was said in January is, what was said, right, right, that's fine. What was said in January 2011 is that you will keep paying uh, your bank, yes. which is FBG. Correct. Then FBG assigns the loan and the mortgage to capital G as it then was in September. And your client gets a notice of assignment that that has happened. Does she not? Uh, she gets a she gets a notice of assignment. Yes. Yeah. So things change. Yes. If, but yeah. Yes. Oh. I, I, I was only I was only suggesting that, and then but that notice of assignment we, again. Let's bear in mind that deed of assignment wasn't valid. That deed of assignment was defective. The confirmation wasn't uh, executed until 2014. Okay. But the confirmation has been executed. Yes, and confirmed the assignment, confirmed the assignment of the legal estate. Again, we get into the issue about the loan, but I, I do want to, have, I, I do make a distinction between the security and the loan. If this is an unsecured loan, that's a very different proposition from uh, an order for possession. Right. If it's an unsecured loan, then the bank is pari passu with everybody else. And that is why all three of the documents are important, but all three of the documents were not pleaded. And it, despite what my, what, what my Lord Bell 
says banks are different from um, other uh, other banks have banks make an appeal to the public for the deposit of their savings. And when a bank transfers its rights and obligations, it transfers its obligation to repay its uh, depositors. And that is a, the, the, the assignment of an obligation to repay is not something that happens easily. The regulators take a very keen interest when banks amalgamate because when, as we saw in the financial crisis, and this is part of the financial crisis, these are subprime loans, uh, made by a Bermuda financial institution, which were taken over by a larger institution. The, the mechanism that they chose to affect that transfer appears to have transferred only the loans and none of the deposits, or none of the obligations to repay the deposits. And has, has been carried out in a manner which frankly, um, any regulator would have found uh, bizarre. But regulators would have blessed this agreement, surely. Uh, that, I don't, uh, that's never been pleaded, that's not an evidence. Well, it, it doesn't need to be pleaded. I'm just saying that there are a limited number of banks in Bermuda, as you have said, they operate subject to the regulation. Yes. And if one if one buys the mortgage portfolio of another, one yes. would expect that regulatory approval would be required. And, 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 and it just so happens, this is a, an anecdote, and I don't want to. Um, but just uh, it, it just so happens that in my I, I, when I have when I have uh, when I have seen claims of this kind made by banks that have been involved in amalgamations in the United Kingdom, the date upon which approval for the amalgamation has always been pleaded because that is one of the conditions of the amalgamation being valid. But my question was the, the, the arrangement. My, my, my position would be that, if I, I'm sorry to interrupt, my position would be that if the BMA have approved this transaction, that should be pleaded. Why should it need because, to be? Because it would be one of the conditions, it, it should be one of the conditions that would, would, would make the, the amalgamation my point, my point valid. My point was simply that one would expect the regulatory authority to approve the transaction. It yes, happens. one would have. One would, have, one, one would, yes. Yeah. You know, I, appreciate, the I appreciate that um, banks are different in the sense that they are subject to a regulator, but um, we're not concerned with the regulation of this bank or these banks in this case. We're concerned with transactions and the law in relation to those transactions is no different in relation to a bank save if the, if the transactions have not been approved by the regulator or wouldn't be approved by the regulator and couldn't be approved by the regulator. Well, it's never because been approved. This, this transaction has the effect of bankrupting First Bermuda Group instantly. First Bermuda Group was, as the Chief Justice point, pointed out, already balance sheet insolvent. Correct. And it should have been put, and then my point would be, it should have been put into liquidation. It doesn't, just because a company is balance sheet insolvent, doesn't mean to say that uh, it gets put into liquidation. One of the ways it can get out of um, being in that position of balance sheet insolvent is a white knight comes along and injects capital and the insolvency is no more. Correct. And that's what is said to have happened. Well, that, they, don't say that's what, they, they don't say that's what's happened. That's the whole point. That's they the whole point. They do not say. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Say. McCosco, will say that that's the effect of the um, documents of amalgamation taken as a whole. That should have been in the evidence. But why? I mean, Mr. Mr. Why? McCoskins, why should that have been in the evidence? Because we would, well, it was one of the issues between the parties was whether or not the transaction was effective. And if it was not, if it was not carried out under, if it was not approved by the regulator and acted uh, in the way that my, that, that my Lord Bell just indicated as a white knight, then it was not a valid well, did you ever suggest that in your Did you ever suggest that in your pleading? This transaction is, this transaction is invalid for the reasons that you've just mentioned? We, Where we do put, we find we, that we in your pleading? Proof, we put them to proof to, as to its validity. That's not no. the same thing. No. Well, we couldn't plead that it hadn't been. 
but we say we doubt that this transaction is valid. And in the correspondence, long before... Yes, but said, you were saying you doubt that it was valid because it, there's a question as to the validity of the instruments of assignment. Quite different point is that the instruments of assignment, even if completely valid and uh, authenticated by every conceivable signatory and seal, nonetheless, the transaction was invalid for, for some reason such as that which you are now referring to. If you were going to say that, you'd have to plead it. Yes, and I would only be able to plead it if I... The, I couldn't say, it was, I, I would say this, that Mrs. Mrs. Ventures took the view that, that there had not been a transfer of her mortgage, uh, that the whole thing was illegal and was a, 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 a property grab. We won't deal with that in any detail. She wrote as much to her bank long before she got any lawyer who would tell her about the subtle distinctions about sealing and, and so on. The whole transaction, when you, if, you, if, you, if you look at it, by which $175 million of deposits and mortgages were transferred, would raise the eyebrows of any lawyer to think that such a transaction could occur on such flimsy documents. Well, that's it, a different point. Well, I, 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 it goes to this. The, I, the I'm afraid I can only mention one point at a time, yes. which is that on the assumption that the asset was validly transferred, if you were going to say that even though it has been validly transferred, the court should set its face against enforcing it because the overall transaction is contrary to some principle, it would be for you to plead it, would it not? And I, I, I submit that we, we, we went far enough by saying that we put them to proof as to the effectiveness of the transaction. That's not pleading it. We didn't plead it precisely, but we didn't. We, we weren't all. confronted with a pleading which which told us about. We weren't confronted with a pleading which told us about the details of the transaction. We were only we were only pleading to a two documents, but we did doubt the validity of the of the transactions as a whole. That was an issue between the parties. As did we just more, did the, more skeleton argument at trial assert that. Um... The transaction was vitiated by a lack of regulatory approval or was otherwise unlawful for uh, a public law reason? No. But that, that, that pours into the, the whole problem of we had asked, we had asked for documents relating to the transaction and how it was achieved and that none were provided. Documents relating to this transaction, and that's why we say that the failure of discovery is so important. None of the documents, even they could have been included in the list of privileged documents, which would lead on a train of inquiry, because my learned friend keeps re referring to relevant documents being disclosed. The failure to disclose this one in the usual way, the asset transfer agreement, tells us that the disclosure process was flawed. All of the documents relating to the uh, validity of the BMA, if we say we doubt the effectiveness of the transaction in our pleadings, the approvals from the BMA are therefore documents that would reasonably expected to lead on a train of inquiry, which is the test from proving guano, and ought to have been disclosed. Did you that make, would have allowed my client to did you make properly. An did you make an application for specific discovery? We did. Documents relating to regulatory approval. We 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 made doc we we were we, there are, there's sworn evidence that the obligations under Order 24 had been complied with. That's not an answer to my Lord's question. Do you think you could be so kind as to answer the questions that we ask you rather than the questions that we didn't ask you? We made, we made applications for further documents. We did not ask specifically for the regulatory ones. But we insisted throughout, up to the very last minute, that there must be more documents relating to this transaction which ought to have been disclosed. And we were told at every turn that there weren't. But it, we now have it that the ATA was available to you 
um, arguably in February and certainly in June. Yes, but that's, again, the, the, the disclosure process under Order 24 is a process where documents are listed that will reasonably be expected to lead on a train of inquiry. I say that at least one document that was re could reasonably expected to lead on a train of inquiry was not included. If they have regulatory approvals, that's another document that could be reasonably expected to lead on a train of inquiry. And there must be many others. Well, the, the, a, the ATA, I take your point, and I think Mr. McCoskill would, should have been disclosed in the list of documents and was not. Yes, and when, he, when it was yes. discovered, when it was I don't understand. Just a minute. I don't understand why documents to the regulator um, would um, fall into the same category. Because those documents, given that the pleadings deny the effectiveness of the transfer, if the regulator has approved it or not approved it, that would be indicative that would lead on a train of inquiry as to the effectiveness of the transfer. So let's say well, they have a document. Lord, as my Lord President asked you just a moment ago, or perhaps it was Mr. Justice Cave, did you make the inquiry? And the answer was no. We didn't make the specific inquiry. We made inquiries well, along the lines of there must specific be Specific inquiry document. is what was required, Mr. Hill. My, my Lord, um, I, I apologize to interject. It's just an interesting point about regulatory approval. Um, on a separate screen, I just um, plugged into Google First Bermuda Group Capital G BMA, and there's an article talking about regulatory approval. It wasn't in discovery. Our, our client didn't, didn't view it as relevant, but it seems fairly trivial. If, if there was concern about regulatory approval, then a, a two-minute Google search seems to confirm that it was granted. Yes. Well, that rather makes my point. If no, what Mr. McCosker is saying is you could have done then what you are saying um, you could do now. Yes, but the, the, the obligation of discovery and disclosure is not one, it's not for me to investigate. It's for them to provide me with documents. And that if would change they, the, they are that relevant would change to the matters in it, Mr. Hill, if they are relevant to the matters in issue between the parties. No, um, I don't, that's not the test. What is the test? What is the test? Whether, the test is whether or not they can reasonably be expected to be on a train of inquiry. In relation to something which is an issue between the parties. Yes. Otherwise, you just produce every conceivable document, whether it's of yes. any relevance to anything between the parties or not. Right. But inadmissible documents are, are disclosable. We documents are. Which, which are. Documents which are not legally relevant are nonetheless to be provided under discovery. If they're not relevant to the matters in issue between the parties? If they are not probative one way or the other, but they lead on a train of inquiries. Well, we, we know the train the of inquiry. The, the train of inquiry issue still relates to the matters in issue between the parties. Yes. But the, the, it's broader than legal relevance. Well, I don't quite understand what's meant by legal relevance. If you're um, only obliged to disclose that which is relevant to the issues between the parties, that will be a matter of legal relevance because it will be relevant to the lawsuit that you're engaged in. Yes, but the, if you're if, if, taking us back to proving guano, the question was whether or not documents which were not uh, um, which would not be admissible and were not relevant in the legal sense. And by relevant, I mean probative one way or the other. Okay. Uh, were in fact disclosable under the rules of discovery. Okay. The decision has sometimes been criticized, but it has the effect of um, uh, making disclosable documents which would not necessarily be admissible um, under the rules of relevance in the sense of probative one way or the other. And that's, it's a, it's a, it is a much broader uh, obligation to provide information. And it, because that informs the defendant in this case, decision is whether or not to continue with her action. 
And if they, rather than just kept saying, we don't have any more documents when they clearly did, uh, she may have taken a different attitude and that may have made a difference, for example, in whether or not she continued, whether or not she settled on the basis that was being offered at the time or may have been offered at the time and so on. But to continue to say, no, we don't have anything else is it something which affects the attitude that the defendant adopts going forward. And then the asset transfer agreement shows up at the last minute uh, when she herself had said, please don't do anything. Uh, you know, I'm, I think we've established it wasn't the last minute, Mr. Hill, so don't make pejorative comments which can't be justified. And uh, the, the, because the effect of this transaction was what it was, and because she was doubting its validity and its ability to, 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 to uh, affect what she was, what, what was being said had, been, had taken place, it was incumbent upon capital G to make the appropriate disclosure. And when documents had been left out of the list to make the appropriate application to have them included in the list. And then the appropriate processes could have been gone through to ensure there, as she did with all the other documents to inspect them and so on. And it, it, it may well be that I'm overreacting, but uh, it's my, my belief that the disclosure, disclosure process is, in fact, extremely important. Well, no doubt it is. Have it, where, have we, where have we got to now? They swore an affidavit saying you've got all the documents that are relevant. They then realised um, that they hadn't disclosed the ATA, which they probably yes. did disclose. Pardon? Which they I, did I, disclose. Well, they put it in a, in a witness statement, which yeah, okay, wasn't they put in a witness statement. They put it in a witness statement. Yes. So the position we've reached on the evidence is that with that exception, they say they've disclosed everything, every, they had disclosed everything that was relevant. Well, the, what, what we have then is we have a, we, we, how can we say? Because they haven't, they, they said they disclosed everything when they hadn't. And uh, so how can we now say that, they, that they're right this time? That's, that's the difficulty. Because once right. you, and, and it's not like, and, it, and again, I, I, I repeat, this is not a peripheral document. Yes, you said that. We understood well, it the I, first I, two it, times it, that you said it. Yes. And, and, and the failure to include this document in the list is indicative of, or I'd say it's at least capable of being indicative of a failure to disclose other documents which may have been assisted. Right. Okay. Well, what, what other documents um, do, do you say? should have been disclosed? What is the nature of such documents? I would have liked to have seen the approvals from the BNA. I would have uh, did, liked to have We've seen already established you didn't ask for it. If you had asked for it, Mr. Hill, um, the um, bank's attorneys would have been obliged to disclose it. You didn't ask for it, presumably, well, because you didn't the think the it wrong was way around, my lord. That's the, well, the obligation of no, discovery. No, no, Mr. Hill, it's not. The, the um, Walkers have taken the view that the regulatory um, material was not relevant to the matters in issue in these proceedings. If you were going to make an argument that they were, you shouldn't have made it, and then the issue could have been determined. That's, uh, I think um, I would submit the regulatory approval is beyond peradventure a document which is relevant to these proceedings. It is just... Well, this, it's, is cloud, it's, it's, this is cloud cuckoo land. Uh, really? It's perfectly apparent from the list of documents that uh, the plaintiffs did not regard the regulatory approvals as disclosable documents. Everybody in Bermuda, well, everybody relevant in Bermuda would know that the Bermuda or Monetary Authority would either have given its approval, most likely because the transaction went ahead, or not given its approval or given it subject to qualifications. You knew that, everybody else knew that. 
if you thought that such a document should have been disclosed uh, and must have been in the in the um, possession of the plaintiff and hadn't been disclosed, you could make an application that it should be disclosed, but you did not. I did not make, I made an application that, that no, I did not make a specific application for those no. documents. And That's once the same as not making an application. Once I was confronted with a, an affidavit that said that the disclosure had been completed, that is uh, definitive. Well, I think we've gone over the fact that you knew that a transaction such as this required regulatory approval. If you thought that there was anything relevant in the regulatory process, which Walkers did not, you should have asked the question. Yes, and that's, I got an affidavit saying that no further documents existed. That's that not the affidavit issue. affidavit is no. definitive. That's definitive, I can't go behind that. You can make an application. Uh, not once you've got an, not once you've got an affidavit. No, no, no. If, you, if the um, deponent says uh, there are no further relevant documents, but it is apparent that he must have some documents, or it must have some documents, which you say to be relevant uh, and that he must be taking the view isn't relevant, you can then make an application uh, which doesn't proceed upon the basis that it's unclear whether or not uh, the plaintiff has such documents, but where the issue is whether the plaintiff is right to say that they're not relevant when you say that they are. And the fact that he's sworn an affidavit saying there are no further documents to be disclosed is not determinative of such an issue. Methinks. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I, that is not. Once you have such an affidavit, then you are, um, no further applications for specific discovery you, uh, could be made. Okay. That's not true. No, I mean, that, that with respect, Mr. Hill, is simply not the case. If you're not satisfied with discovery, um, you make an application. And you seem to be suggesting to us that if, if an affidavit uh, averring that full disclosure has been made is put in, you can't do anything more. Well, that's not true. Would it be sensible to look at the documents to see whether or not they do or do not have the effect um, that the parties say they do or don't have? Um, yes, the asset transfer agreement right. is at page 200. Page 200. Uh, I'm going to look at the first page. We can see that it states, per Brian Myrie, who was the dead lawyer at uh, Capital G, this document is not to be copied to Mrs. Ventures. Yes. And which is, why, which is why I now assume that it wasn't copied to Mrs. Ventures. It would certainly be a fair assumption for me to make. Yeah. The, the next. But dis despite that, it was referred to in the witness statement of Mr. Fiala. Yes. And then the operative portion is over the page. Yes. And it deals at uh, page 204. In consideration of the transfer of the assets by the transfer or to the transferee, they shall pay all the associated, all costs associated with the ongoing maintenance of the transfer or in compliance with applicable laws. And then the transferor hereby assigns and transfers to the transferee 
and then they assume the same. The assets, all of the transfers' rights against third parties, including rights under any warranties, etc. Which includes the rights against your client. Uh, yes, yes. And then all other assets, rights, or benefits of the transferor relating to or connected with or belonging to or required or intended for use in the business. And then the assets are defined back at page 202. Assets means all and every asset, right, and benefit of the transferor included in the balance sheet of the transferor as set out in Schedule 1, as well as the assumed liabilities goodwill, IT systems, and so contract, contracts, intellectual property rights, the properties, any right of action in which the transferor may be entitled, whether in contract or tort, and the records which should exclude the excluded liabilities. And that would, would, would it not include the transferor's rights as against your client? Correct. Yes, but the puzzling feature Hello. is that assets is defined so as to exclude excluded liabilities. And for my part, I have some difficulty in understanding how a liability, whether excluded or not, is to be regarded as an asset. Well, uh, because the assumed liabilities are assets. If you look at the definition of assumed liabilities, assumed liabilities means the rights and benefits of the transfer war at the date hereof. So that appears to be a definition which includes assets and not liabilities. And the excluded liabilities means all of the liabilities or obligations of or arising to the transfer or business or assets other than the assumed liabilities. So the language appears, it's certainly deceptive. I don't know quite what it means, but they, they take the assets, they take the assumed liabilities, which are in fact assets, and they exclude all of the other liabilities uh, relating to the transfer of his business. And it is my contention that this document has the effect of transferring the assets, but not the deposits. No obligation to repay the deposit as a transfer. I mean, it is very curious because um, you say that assumed liabilities is in fact defined as a right and benefit, which is not a liability, but an asset, in fact. Uh, though excluded liabilities is defined as a liability, though that begs the question as to why, if it is a liability, uh, you need to exclude it from the definition of asset. Because if you're transferring assets, you aren't doing anything with liabilities. And I, I can't say that, but I, want, I, I assume it's because they wanted to uh, belt and brace the idea that they were not taking any responsibility for the repayment of the deposits. Now, the learned judge, the learned chief so justice... Oh, I see. So they're transferring the assets and they say that's to exclude the excluded liabilities, which is the liabilities relating to the business or assets, just in case anybody thought that by transferring the assets, they were impliedly transferring the liabilities. I, I assume, I mean, I, I, I can't get into the head of the draft sure of this topic. Very funny uh, way of drafting. But they were making it clear that the exclusion from um, excluded uh, liabilities, namely the assumed liabilities, was the rights of the transferor. Yes. Making it, I suppose, even more apparent. That we're not taking the deposits. The rights of the transferor that are going and they don't bring with them the excluded liabilities, 
but what does go are the rights and benefits of the transferor. Correct. Very old piece of draftsmanship. The whole transaction is very odd. Well, the transaction is not odd. The draftsmanship well, the, is very curious. Yes, yes. This, this is a, this is a, the, 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 the mechanisms used in this document are peculiar. I wonder and I assume, well, and I assume that they have been they have been drafted this way to to ensure that they take the benefit of the deposits because that's a right that the bank has to use the deposits as they will, and they accept none of the liability to return them. Now they have returned them. It would seem. Who knows? Is is uh, the learned chief justice found as a fact that there had been no problem with the depositors? although there was no evidence on the question. And uh, I, I wonder whether did... the draftsman made a mistake if it assumed liabilities and that what he meant to say, assumed my liabilities means um, the liabilities or, liabilities or obligations of the transfer of of the transfer or at the date hereof in relation to the assets. And that gets me to the point that had this document been produced at, at the appropriate time, that could have become a pleaded issue. To well, you had plenty of, Mr. Hill, it does annoy me that you don't seem to uh, grasp the point. You had plenty of time to get that document at an earlier stage. If you had done so and you wanted to make a pleading point on it, you could have applied to amend your pleading. Uh, what would you have amended your pleadings to say? The, the transaction was uh, illegal. It shouldn't be enforced. Because? Because, because, it, it, because it, it rendered uh, First Bermuda Group instantly bankrupt, completely, irredeemably. Well, that on your case is apparent from what you say is the construction of this agreement. Yes. Well, in that case, you didn't need anything other than the agreement. Correct, but I didn't have the agreement at the pleading well, I know, stage. But you did have the agreement in the end. Yes. And the, the, very learned, end. Judge, the learned judge dealt with its true construction. And it's difficult to see. He, that's a question of fact, and it was not an issue. It, it had not been. It had not been properly. It's not a question of fact. It's a mixed question of fact and law. No, it isn't. Well, it is if you have to go to behind the scenes and say, what did they mean? Well, you're not normally entitled to reduce evidence of what. You mean? Well, you, you can. I mean, if you if you look at Manai and West Bromwich, uh, and the document is not clear, and you yourself, my lord, have just pointed out that perhaps, perhaps the drafter uh, meant to include the word uh, obligation or or what have you, and that and that that would have been something that could have been established by. Well, that would have been for something for the for the plaintiff to establish. You had yes. the good fortune of having an agreement which arguably on its true construction yes. uh, does not transfer the liabilities to the depositors. What more do you need? Well, the, well I'm, I'm reluctant to say that I, I didn't have the agreement, but the... Good. By the time of the trial, you had the agreement. There was yes. argument on the agreement. You gave your arguments as to its true construction, repeatedly telling us that you didn't have the agreement is incorrect and unhelpful. Very well. And I, and I said to the, 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 the learned Chief Justice that on its true construction, this agreement uh, effectively back, and his, his response in, the, in his ruling is that that construction leads to an absurd result hmm. uh, without uh, analyzing whether or not that he, 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 which requires him to find as a fact that what it says is not what they meant. Well, no, wait a what it says no. appears to me, what it says appears clear. He says that what it says means this. You disagree with that. That is a difference of construction 
the relevant facts um, are A, what the agreement says, and B, I suppose, the, the, the obvious fact that if it transfers only the uh, assets but not the liabilities, uh, that sounds most implausible. It does sound, it does sound um, a, a, a peculiar thing to have done, yeah. but on its, okay. on its face, that appears to be what it did. And that is one of our grounds of appeal, that, is, that, that the Chief Justice was wrong to reach that conclusion. Yeah, I quite understand that you say the Chief Justice was wrong. What, what I'm afraid I find slightly unhelpful uh, is your constantly saying that something needed to be pleaded, uh, that you didn't have the agreement, etc. Let's come to the question as to whether the Chief Justice got the construction right. Um, firstly, he didn't, unless I've missed something in his judgment, deal with the significance, if any, of the definition of assets, excluded liabilities, and assumed liabilities. That's right, no. isn't it? Correct. W w w was that um, addressed uh, w when submissions were made to him? Did were submissions made in relation to those provisions of the agreement? Uh, my, my submission was that the uh, agreement was did not contain any transfer of the, the obligations. Uh, I did not go through them in detail. If, if I may assist, I should add as well, this is perhaps when a transcript might be helpful, but um, as the Chief Justice's ruling um, confirms, my friends delivered some written submissions uh, in advance of the hearing and then uh, a, a further developed, uh, improved set of submissions after, some days after the hearing. And the appellant's complaints in relation to the ATA were ventilated at length in those improved written submissions. Right. Well, did they address the point that I was on about, uh, about the mean the meaning of assets, excluded liabilities, and assumed liabilities? I believe so. Right. Okay. But, Mr. Hill, can I just get, go into that? Because the, the Chief Justice dealt with it at paragraph 27 of his judgment. Um, and he takes exception to the fact that a week after the hearing, you submitted an updated and improved uh, document comprising 94 paragraphs, that is some 34 more than um, comprised previously, and taking on board what Mr. McCosker has just said, that these in, um, this document included submissions as to the uh, proper construction of the ATA, those um, must have been matters which you could have urged upon the Chief Justice with... Um, your skeleton argument, which should have been provided seven days before the hearing. Um, yes, but I'm, I'm, I'll go back a little bit in time if I might. Your Lordship may recall in relation to another appeal with which I was involved, my being trapped in Scotland uh, with no access to, hang on, it, it does make, it, it is, it is the point. And it was, that was, I was, it was immediately, it was the week before this trial, that, that occurred. And so that is why my submissions were late. And it, to some extent, why I didn't have a copy of the, because I, I didn't have access. If your Lordship remembers, Scotland went into a fairly heavy lockdown the day after I arrived and my chambers were shut uh, and my internet was not working at my flat in Edinburgh and so on. And your Lordship will recall that the story was told in another appeal. And that is why my submissions were late. And, and, I, and I, do recall that, I do recall that, Mr. Hill, but uh, equally, it's, Surely, if, if you're inhibited from um, filing a proper document because of your um, experiences in lockdown in Scotland, those are matters which you should have explained to the Chief Justice and asked for an extension in, of time within which you could um, make a hearing which dealt with it rather than yes. doing so um, seven uh, uh, days after the hearing had finished. Yes, and I did. And he said that I, I, could, I would be like, permitted to improve my skeleton argument. But he felt that I'd improved no. it um, a, a bit too much. Well, what no. he said is that you sought leave to correct typ typographical, typographical errors, errors yes. and produced 34 more pages, which on no conceivable view could be more paragraphs, my lord. More what? paragraphs. It was, it was more paragraphs. It oh, was okay, 34 paragraphs. 
Yes. And, and if, if, again, I'm, I'm going to have to repeat this bit about the ATA for a moment. Um, whatever said about whether or not I should have got it earlier, I, I didn't. And so the, the first time I really analyzed it in any detail was once I got back to Bermuda. And that was why I dealt with it for the first time in my, in my submissions in that way. I, I'm not repeating the point. I'm simply saying that the moment I had it, I hadn't had it before then. And so this was the first time that I addressed it in submissions. Mm. And that's why it was not in my original, it was not in any detail in my initial, because I didn't know the document was there until I got back to Bermuda. Yes. And, then I, and then there was the problem of me not being allowed into the court and so on. Yes, not very I acceptable was, for you to tell the Chief Justice you want to make some typographical amendments. And in fact, you want to add 30 paragraphs. Well, it, it, I, I discussed it with my learned friend as well. And I, when I realized that I, I, I perhaps was going to have to overstretch what I'd said, and I, 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 I didn't attempt to do anything and I, I made the point to the Chief Justice as well that this is much more than I asked for, and I, I leave it to you. And that was what we agreed, Mr. McCosker and I, uh, should take place. So I, I accept that they went further than I initially okay. thought they would need to. The respondent raised raised an objection once the improved submissions were submitted. exactly, and, and we, do, we 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 just, we decided on a process by which I could put them in, and then what what would become of them would, and then Mr. McCosker raised his. His point, which I accept, was what he could validly make. Um, well, the uh, Chief Justice was, didn't didn't agree that you could put them in. That's the point. No, ex exactly. No. But uh, it, it, the the point was nonetheless made that this document didn't transfer the. It, it was made orally that this document didn't transfer the liabilities. And that construction was held to be absurd because of its effect and not because of what the document says. Sorry, say that again more slowly. The, the, the construction which I advanced uh, orally and, and then in, in my written submissions was that this document did not transfer the uh, liabilities. Yes. Uh, the Chief Justice on, found on its true construction that that yeah. wasn't so because of the effect that that would have and not because of the words used in the document. Well, no, no, you keep on saying that. The Chief Justice found against you because on his construction, I know oh, you said okay. it's wrong, of paragraph three at page 205, he thought yeah. that that covered a transfer of liabilities. It's quite erroneous to say <laughs> he found against you uh, because he didn't like the effect of the contrary conclusion. He goes on. He goes on in his in his ruling yeah. to to make that point. Yes, he goes on, but you 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 fasten on points as if they were the only point when it's perfectly plain from the judgment why the chief justice came to his conclusion. Should we have a look at paragraph three to see whether it's right or wrong? Yes. Why do you say the Chief Justice got it wrong? Uh, he, he said that the words, the transfer, he shall pay all costs associated with the ongoing maintenance of the transfer or amounted to uh, a transfer of the liabilities. And I say he got it wrong because that's contrary to the express wording of the agreement. Right. And so that construction is simply not open, but the express wording excludes what is contended for. And by the, which express wording are you referring to? The excluded liabilities, the right. definition of excluded liabilities. Yeah. The assumed liabilities has the effect of excluding the transfer of the asset, the 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 the, um, the obligations in relation to the depositors. Right. Right. Right.
Can I, can I tell if I might, in, in, a, in a little bit more detail, with this question of the witness statement? Which witness statement? The, the witness statement of Mr. Fiala that contains the asset transfer. Yes. There was an order that there be a, an exchange of witness statements between the parties. And this is Ventures. Can you tell me when that order was made? My Lord, the, the order, I, I believe, um, I'll get you a record of appeal reference, but it was in June. The, the, the matter had been before the court on the, 17th, on the 13th of February, uh, at which date um, arrangements were made for trial. However, the trial was adjourned one day before in June. Um, and it was at that occasion that in June that orders were made for the exchange of witness statements. If you bear with me while Mr. Hill continues, I'll, I'll find a reference for you. So the witness statement was ready. It had been signed by Mr. Fiala. And as we know, it contained a document about which Mrs. Ventures knew nothing. Yes. It was withheld and nothing said about the existence of that document for the period while Mrs. Ventures worked out what she could do about getting a, a more fulsome witness statement. But it, it was withheld because your client was in default of her obligations in relation to witness statements. Quite. Now, the question then is, does that default on the part of my client mean that the existence of the, trans the asset transfer agreement should remain secret until she's not in default, that it would have been perfectly possible for that document to be being disclosed without disclosing the entire witness statement. I take that. And in fact, there's. I take that the point on on board, Mr. Hill. It would it would still have been open. Um, to the respondent to correct its um, document disclosure. And, and, and the, the cases that we have here tell us what should happen when you discover a late document that hasn't been disclosed. And what should happen is an application should be made to file a supplemental list. That list should contain the documents that have been discovered, which were not previously disclosed. And those doc, and then the the appropriate directions can be given. Nothing in Mrs. Venture's failure to uh, be in a position to exchange witness statements can be said to have held up that process. And had she known that there was a document in there that was essential or of some considerable importance, then she may have adopted a different attitude. But from her point of view. The witness, she knows the story. There was nothing in the witness statement that was new. Um, and that is ultimately why she elected to rely on the affidavit she drafted some years earlier. But this idea that the fact that it was included in a document that wasn't exchanged obviated the requirement to disclose its existence really does put the cart before the horse. And it's for that reason that I've been saying, and it's in that sense that I'm talking about disclosure. It, the, the obligation is to disclose the documents that exist the moment you know they exist, if you well, haven't disclosed them already. I, I think we can accept that, um, subject to anything Mr. McCosker says, that um, the bank was in, in um, breach of its obligations but it did eventually correct the position and it did so in sufficient time for you to view the document and uh, make any submissions on it which you wished. So th no. this, appeal, this appeal surely is not going to uh, turn on your suggestion that uh, the document should have been made available to you earlier. It, it, it could do. I, because, because and again, I, I don't want to encourage, encourage your Lordship's ire, the date I actually got the document was extremely late. Yes, and but it said that, that, it said that that's your fault. 
But that has nothing to do with whether or not the document should have been disclosed the moment it was discovered. I really don't understand why this is looming so large on this application. I mean, if we accept for the moment you had a, a grievance about the lateness, that could be remedied in a, a number of ways uh, by applications which may or may not be granted. You could apply for an adjournment, but I doubt whether a judge would ever grant you an adjournment at that stage because of a six page document. Um, if the case runs its course and you lose, uh, and you lose solely because of that document, you might be able to say certain things in relation to costs. Um, but one way or another, the document was going to get in, it got in, and it was construed. And the important thing is its construction, not some ventilation of now age-old grievances about the chronology. In fact, I, I agree with almost every word your Lordship says. And I do say that we lost, had this document not been in, um, the outcome might have been different. Uh, that it could have had an implication as to cost. Um, and I do say that the construction that was put on upon it was not properly ventilated before his lordship because the document had not been, because it had not in a, in a timious manner its terms had not been appropriately uh, ventilated. Mr. Hill, you, you made your submissions on the construction of the document. Mr. Yes. McCosker made his, and the judge took a view, and you now disagree with that view. But um, I don't understand the point that uh, if, if this is part of your case, that you weren't um, a able to make the, the appropriate argument in relation to the construction of the document. You clearly did so. And it, indeed, when the Chief Justice is dealing with it, um, he refers to exactly that. Let me take you to paragraph 153 of the judgment when he says, the interpretation urged by Mr. Hill, so you were urging it, leads to entirely perverse results and a commercially nonsensical result. He says at 149, he goes through um, your argument in relation to the asset transfer agreement. Mr. Hill argues that the agreement is invalid, unenforceable, not supported by valuable consideration. So all of those arguments were made to the Chief Justice and he rejected them. Yes. It's not as if you weren't able to make the arguments. You clearly did. Yes. I, I don't think I was able to make them as fulsomely as I might have done had I well, been given more time. Well, then you would make an application before the Chief Justice for more time, and that's something that you didn't do. Well, uh, as, Mr. As, as my Lord uh, Kay has just said, I, I wouldn't have been given it at, at that late, late stage, but um, I'm, your, your, your Lordship's quite right. I made my, my albeit was slightly rudimentary submission right. uh, on the day. So, so the, the point is an arid one, isn't it? In terms of the late disclosure. You had your chance, you did make the submissions. The Chief Justice simply took a different view of the construction of the ATA. Yes, well, that, 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 that's one way of looking at it. The, What's the, the other the, way? The, 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 the rules of disclosure are, um, uh, again, I don't wish to, it, 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 the, 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 I'm, I'm talking about the two track procedure. The, the, the rules of disclosing what they had the moment they knew they, they had it are important. The failure to disclose one document may be indicative of failure to disclose many others. Now, forgive and me, could we just break the, for a moment? There's something happening behind me which I need to adjust. For how long for, my lord? Two Sorry. and a half minutes. Oh, I see.
time to. Sorry about that interruption. But to, to return to a more general point, and it may well be that I do overreact to these things, but it's my submission that the, the rules that are contained for the appropriate and proper disclosure of evidence are important. And the failure to comply with those rules and to miss by this much. So we have here a document which on its face says, don't give it to Mrs. Ventures. It turns out it wasn't given to Mrs. Ventures. that it's a document of some considerable importance, which may on its face uh, render the transaction um, illegal in the, in the, in the sense that it, it, it's unenforceable. It may evince uh, an attempt to leave the liabilities behind so the, so the illegality depends uh, upon On the construction, your construction, which the Chief Justice rejected. Rejected, and I and I say it was wrong to do so. Yeah, and I, and I and I at least say that that is that is that is that is more than arguable. I have a reasonable prospect of success on the point as to whether or not this agreement well, was probably. If we're, if we're getting on, if we're getting onto your order, two Rule Thirty Three um, application, um, you keep on misstating the correct test. In, in Ms. Venture's affidavit, you, you twice, um, and that, which I assume you drafted, you twice refer to the test. Paragraph five, a reasonable prospect of success. Um, and you make the same. Um, 31, a reasonable chance of success. Both of those are misstatements of what uh, Order 2 Rule 33 provides, which is a reasonable probability of success, a rather higher threshold. I, 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 for, for, there will be no, Mr. McCosker's, um, Mr. McCosker's um, description of how the test works is one with which I would not disagree. It is a higher threshold than is required for leave. Right, so it's not it helpful. Is, uh, it's not helpful to um, put, mistake the test as you have done. There we are. Okay. 
And, and you'll and say that there's no, no misunderstanding in relation to this. I think we may have indicated this before. But since on this hearing, we are have to determine, amongst other things, whether there is a reasonable probability of success, uh, it may be that if we were to determine, there's a big if there, but if we were to determine there was not a reasonable probability of success, uh, that we would go on uh, to dismiss the appeal, because on that footing, there would no reason, be no reason to continue. Well, that would be the, the, the question would then be whether or not you would give uh, Mrs. Ventures the opportunity, Mrs. Ventures the opportunity to pay her security and the other. No, 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 uh, no, 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 I don't think you're, you're understanding me. Right, this, I mean, yeah, let me say it again. In order to determine whether she should be allowed to uh, appeal as a poor person, the order requires us to decide whether or not she has a reasonable probability of success. There's, there's no escaping that, that's the test. Correct. If we were to determine that um, she had no reasonable probability of success, that is in effect a, a determination that she will probably fail. Uh, in those circumstances, it might be appropriate, uh, in fact, to dismiss the appeal or not allow it to be reinstated uh, upon the footing that if the three of us sitting as a court of appeal think that um, the appeal will probably fail, we are in fact performing the same exercise uh, as we would perform in deciding whether it should fail or something very similar. If, if Mrs. Ms. Ms. Ventures is unsuccessful in her application in relation to being a poor person, that she doesn't get over the reasonable probability of success hurdle. Yeah. The question would then be whether or not her appeal should be reinstated and she, be, she should be obliged to continue as a, as a rich person or a, a not poor person. Yes. And to dismiss the appeal in that circumstance, she would have to have no probability of success. Well, I'm not sure. To pay the, five, the, the, uh, the, the, reasonable, the reasonable probability of success I, I'll, I'll leave this to Mish. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that in a moment. Yeah, Any okay, think about it. The probability of success on the restoration application as well, don't you? That's, That's something I was to make, Mr. Hill. When, when you argued the Order 5 Rule 1 application before me as the single judge, the, the ground for your client being relieved of um, the obligation to comply with Order 5 Rule 1 was simply the order to rule 33 application, which had not been made. Um, so if, if we leave the order to rule 33 application on one side for the moment, what are the grounds on which you should um, seek restoration and relief under order five rule one? Um, I, would, I, would, I would ask to, to give it the opportunity to find the, the security that's been ordered to be paid. Sorry, you, you would do what? I would, I would just simply ask the court to, to permit her to get one more attempt to find the $5,000 uh, security. And if she can come up with it, if we gave her another two days or so, if she can find the $5,000. Well, I find that strange because either she, she can find the $5,000, in which case um, there must be a question mark as to whether she is indeed a poor person or she can't. Well, she hasn't been able to find it so far. So therefore, um, isn't that the end of the matter? Or well, there, may, there, may be, there may be a possibility that I will, that I can play with the money. I've been unwilling to do so to date. The well, question, I'll, I'll, I'll be addressing that in my, in my responsive submissions because that's quite a remarkable state of affairs where the appellant has gone on oath that she is a poor person. She's also given evidence under oath at trial, which unfortunately you don't have before you, but which the Chief Justice referred to in his, in his ruling, where she said she had money set aside for the mortgage. She's either poor or she's not. And the suggestion that my friend might advance her litigation funding is... I'll have to address that in my submissions. It's really well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I will, and that's why I say we should maybe give us some time. Um, I, I, I don't that, think the test that, is different. That's all. I need to think about it. Well, the the position is as Mrs. McCosker says: either she's poor or she's not. 
correct. She's definitely poor. I mean, they're, they're, she's definitely poor. Well, you say that, um, but as Mr. McCosker has said, she to, she um, she hasn't paid about four hundred and eighty thousand dollars worth of what she owes the bank. Uh, she said to the Chief Justice that she'd been saving money for that purpose. Um, as I understand it, her affidavit evidence is that that money has been slowly whittled away as her income sources have dried up. Uh, and people, she had she had some of the rooms in the house that she was renting out. Um, the tenants ceased payment. She sued but, some but of them. But Mr. Mr. Hill, um, the position would be much more helpful from the court's point of view if, when she has made a statement that she's been putting money on one side, if she would disclose to the court how much that money is, how much it was, uh, the extent to which it, it was whittled away, and, and what it now is. She provided a bank statement. Well, she provided three bank statements, um, one of which I think had $3,000, and the other had practically nothing. I don't think she actually says that those are the only bank, statement, bank accounts that she has. And since she's a lady who's used a number of aliases, one might possibly be skeptical in the absence of specific evidence. Oh, yeah. Well, aliases, she changed her name by Jean Paul. Okay. But, but, and she's had a couple of divorces. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, I mean, she's a... Uh, That's that's not for now, uh, but uh, I will. I will. If, if your lordships find that there's no reasonable probability of success, then she would fail on the pure the, on the poor person point. The, the rule thirty three point. Yeah, and that would the, 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 you wouldn't need to dismiss the appeal. The appeal's already dismissed. There would be no basis upon which to restore it. Yeah, unless you paid that. unless you, unless you paid the money. And then if she has the money to pay, then she can, we'll, we'll see with, the, with that. Yeah. But well, today she doesn't have the money. Well, no, no, wait a moment. You said there would be no basis to restore, to restore it unless she has the money. Well, the, the, um, at the moment, it's, the moment the, the appeal is dismissed. I know. So if she can't convince you to, to allow her to proceed as a poor person and therefore relieve her of the obligations to pay the security, then there would be no grounds upon which to restore it. The other application which she might make would be to say, okay, can you please give me two more days in extremis to see if I can come up with some money and your lordships can take that and leave that as, as, you, as you find it. My learned friend will make submissions. It may well be that she can't come up with the money. I, I would make uh, the, the comment, Mr. Hill, I find that a very unsatisfactory notion. Um, if she's able to produce uh, the, the money now, and she says she's not, how does she get to be able to produce it in two days? Well, she could ask, she could ask all her friends again. Well, she's already asked them, surely. She has. Yeah. yeah. And they've said no, and they, uh, uh, they will be that one of them has been, uh, they would change their mind. I wouldn't ask for more than a day or two. Yeah. Be no, no, it's certainly not something to leave in the out in the open for a terribly long time. Okay, sorry, it's important to address the separate issues. On the question as to whether she, she um, well, let's start again. The appeal has no longer exists. So there is an application to restore it. Uh, the test for whether or not there should be a restoration of an appeal that has been dismissed for non-compliance with the rules, or two relevant rules, is whether there is good and sufficient cause. That's the relevant test under Order 2, Rule 17. So far as the question of um, appealing as a poor person is concerned, there are two questions. Firstly, whether she is in fact a poor person, 
And secondly, whether she has a reasonable probability of success. Uh, let us assume that we were to conclude that she did not have a reasonable probability of success uh, and therefore uh, wasn't going to be allowed to appeal as a poor person. On that assumption, would we be entitled not to restore the application because in the light of our finding that there was no reasonable probability of success, there was no good and sufficient cause to restore it. I had assumed the answer to that question was no, but I, I, I would need to give it some more thought because the two tests are different. I know the two and, tests are different. And saying that there's no, that, that doesn't have a reasonable probability of success is not the same thing as saying there is no probability of success. And the fact that there may exist an arguable probability of success, even if uh, remote, say, say the sort of test you would apply for leave, whether or not that would amount to a good and sufficient cause is uh, something I haven't yeah, yes, well, that's if, fine. I she, just wanted to give you notice of what was going through my mind. And if she hasn't, if she hasn't paid, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would ask your lordships to make an order along the lines of um, that, that unless she pays within uh, twenty-four hours, the, the security required the, the appeal to um, still be dismissed properly and not administratively in that case. But I would ask that she be given it, whether or not she's successful in finding the, the, the funds is uh, separate. Um, well, it would be unless she paid within X days or hours, the appeal yes, would not that, be... That would, the, would, let me finish before you interrupt. The appeal sorry. would not be restored. Yes. Yeah. But, right. and, and, I would, and, and I would take that to mean that that would be a different dismissal from the administrative dismissal that takes place on the presentation of the certificate. Well, the administrative because dismissal is, is, a, is a done deed. It has happened. Yes, yes. You are exactly. now, a, you, there is presently no appeal. Yes. You are now applying to restore the appeal. Yeah. It may be a distinction without a difference, but I, I, I think... I, well, I, I, a, never mind whether it's a distinction without a difference, it's a distinction. Yes. Right. Can you just help me on this? Um, we know that the putative assignment took place uh, in September um, 2011, and there was notice of the assignment given to your client. Whom did she pay after September 2011? She continued, as I understand it, to pay into her account at First Bermuda Group for a oh. period. And then on a, then on, on a given day, and, and I don't know what day that is, after that, the, that she was unable to continue doing that. The offices <laughs> were shut and she was unable, and the account was said not to exist. Uh, if, if, if I may interject, um, the subject of the default under the 2010 loan um, is referenced at page 830 of the record of appeal. Right. That, took, that, that 830 of the record, now I should add, that is from Mr. Fiella's witness statement. What that establishes is that concurrent with the appellant's receipt of the letter that we looked at earlier, where... First Bermuda informed its customers of what was going to happen. I'm referring to paragraph 72, yeah. have, my lords. Um, when it, it appears that when she received that letter, payments stopped. Now, what and I, I'm, I, I regret that I'm having to speak from my recollection of what happened at trial because we don't have a transcript, but it was a subject that I cross-examined the appellant on at length because she maintained that payments continued to be made. And I asked the question, we don't have any record of that. What did you do? Do you have receipts? Do you have evidence? 
She then made the assertion that she was making payments in cash, which was a subject that I cross-examined her at length on. Now, that's all I can say from my recollection, my lords, because you don't have the transcript. Um, but, but that was the evidence at trial. And paragraph 72 of Mr. Fowler's witness statement is the evidence uh, in chief of the bank that was before the court. Now, your evidence was that you didn't make payments after... Um, February 2011. She made some sporadic payments. Yes. And, and the, um, the, the point that was taken, or the evidence that was given by the appellant from my recollection, is that she had been making payments, but they weren't reflected in the account statements. And under cross-examination, uh, because there was no ability to produce evidence of those payments from her part, uh, the evidence that she gave in the end was that she made these deposits in cash. Yes. Um, but, uh, just a moment. Um, if you go to page uh, 844, there is a schedule of the payments received um, and uh, they uh, show payments uh, being, well, the 6,278 is paid in February 2010 and March 2010, and again in July, uh, and there's a June, which looks like, which is two 6,278s, and the same- Certainly payments were being made. Well, yes. wait a minute, yes, but just a minute. 6,000, and payments were being made, um, well, they've been being made in 2011, um, but they were also being made in 2012, 2000 and 2013. Indeed, the last statement payment was in January 2014. Right. Now, forget about payments in cash, because you say she didn't make them, and the judge, Chief Justice, agreed with you. But the payments that were made in 2011, 12, 13, and 14 must have been made to somebody. Yes, and, and I do stand corrected, my Lord. Uh, it, it's certainly clear that payments in varying sums were made right up until January of 2014. So yeah. the question is, when did payments stop being made? My, my response ought to have been up until January 2014. Right. Yes, that, that, yeah, that wasn't actually my question. Well, it was my question, but it, it was the precursor to a marginally more important question is, to whom were they paid? Were fact, they paid to the putative assignee or not? They were paid into the FBG account, by the way. Were they? Yes. Okay. And that is the point at which they were the, there, was, there was a moment, and it appears to be around about then, when the FBG account ceased to exist. Right. And that was when she, you're not, she began to complain about um, capital G or Clarion not being her mortgagee. Okay. And we still don't know um, when she stopped making payments, the amount of monies that she put aside. In other words, whether she was paying them uh, the amount of the monthly payment to uh, uh, some other account or accumulating I, I, it in some way. I, I, I think it would be safe to assume that it would be a sum less than the monthly amount. And it has since been um, used up for other purposes. So. Um, but I, I, given, the, given the erratic payments, um, when she had a bank account in which to pay it, I can't imagine that she was saving terribly much, but um, she wasn't asked. Okay. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to work out where we are. Uh, the... the um, The, the question is, the, the, Mrs. Venture says that because of the, 
the proper construction of the asset transfer agreement, the assignment and the confirmation. Th this is not the correct plaintiff. Th those documents failed to <coughs> properly transfer to the plaintiff the rights under the uh, equitable mortgage, which is asserted. It failed to do so, one, because the transaction itself ought not to be enforced because it has the effect of impoverishing uh, or bankrupting FBG. And that, that is something to which this court should not lend its authority. And that what should have happened is the, the insolvency of the banking institution, First Bermuda Group, as revealed by its balance sheet, should have triggered steps being taken uh, to properly protect the depositors and the uh, other stakeholders because there would have been contracts behind the scenes beyond depositors. But on the Chief Justice's interpretation, the um, depositors were protected um, by the amalgamation with capital G. Yes, that's true. As we say, and I say that the Chief Justice's interpretation flies in the face of the express wording of the agreement. Yes, you, you said that. Assume for the moment that you are right about that, that the Chief Justice's interpretation was wrong. Um, but in fact, assume also that everybody has proceeded upon the basis um, that the obligations to the depositors uh, were taken over um, by um, FB, by, I forget which one it is now, um, uh, by, Clarion. Uh, by Clarion. Yes. Um, and all the depositors have been treated fine and no authority has ever complained. Uh, in those circumstances, I mean, and, and assume that, that, that um, everybody has assumed that the agreement means the opposite of what you mean, but that they got it wrong. But nonetheless, that's the basis upon which they have proceeded. Um, are you still saying that uh, in those circumstances, uh, the transaction is so improper that uh, this court should decline to enforce it? Yes. Seems very odd. Well, because... that, that... go ahead, Mother, I'm sorry. I mean, there are, there are various means by which um, you can seek uh, to set aside a transaction uh, under the uh, Convancing Act or otherwise, or under the Companies Act. Um, and if those courses are open to you, uh, if you say there was an intention to defraud, um, but nobody has ever taken them, uh, why in this case should the court invalidate, uh, in effect, uh, a claim for the return of money lent? Because somebody might have claimed that they could set aside the transaction, but never has. What we say is that this plaintiff, we don't say anything about the validity of the mortgage. Or the equitable, we, what we say, well, hang on, that's not true. Yes, you do. I, I, take that, I take that back as quickly as I can. Yes. What we, what we say is, whatever claims are available under the mortgage are claims that should be exercised by someone else. And the, the way that the unenforceability of contracts is dealt with is that when something happens under the which is, which the parties, which the parties simply do because it's it's open. To, they've they've done it. The court doesn't reverse those. But when a party like Ms. Venture says, "Oh, hang on, 
the court shouldn't lend its authority to this transaction. The chips simply fall where they lie. So those who have already paid their mortgages, who have had their homes repossessed, who have done everything, and the depositors, and all of that stuff which has happened behind the scenes is unaffected by uh, Mrs. Venture suggesting that the bank, the, co the court shouldn't lend its authority to enforcing the agreement as against her. That didn't come out very well, but- No, oh, I'm afraid I haven't followed. The, what she's, what she's simply asking is the court not to enforce what she says is an improper agreement. And if the court decides that the agreement is improper, then it simply doesn't enforce it and the chips fall where they lie. And it has no effect upon the rights of other people who may have handled themselves differently from Ms. Ventures. Okay. And the, 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 view, the sort of slightly new approach although it wouldn't have made any difference to any of the, the decisions that you read in the past, the new approach, when you, when you have a, a right like this, and the court, when, it, when, it's, when it's tainted with some kind of um, moral turpitude or the, the difficulties that are caused, for example, by this transaction rendering the FBG insolvent, the court doesn't invalidate the, doesn't simply say everything under this agreement is invalid. It just simply stands back and washes its hands of it and leaves the parties to arrange themselves as they, as they can without the enforceability of the, without the mechanisms of the court available to them. And that's what should happen here. And if, FBG wishes to come and get its money, then of course it can, but many of the defences would, would be open to us again concerning but, but the equitable mortgage and so on. But if FBG were to come and get its money um, and succeed on the basis that Ms. Venture's debt was owed to them, they would get a money judgment and they wouldn't get possession of the property because of the, uh, the fact that uh, that has been assigned to capital G now clarion. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I, I, no, I believe that we say that the transaction is tainted and that they would still have No, there would be, if you're right, my lord, there'd be an unsecured creditor for the loan amount. Right. So, so that instead of the Chief Justice's finding that Ms. Ventures uh, paid a Clarion Bank almost $800,000 um, in principal, uh, $420,000 in interest, late fees, and so on, um, that those uh, would be matters for which FBG would be able to sue. That's your case. Yes. And in fact, the Chief Justice suggested at one of the hearings that they simply be joined and uh, that that step was not taken. Wait, can I just make sure I, I understood you? You say that FGB can claim the monetary, the money, but it would be unsecured. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about that. That's a question that my Lord has asked me. and I Well, that's what I thought you had given as an answer. Yes, yes that's what I, I thought. When I, when I think about it... <laughs> But that's not a surprising proposition, Mr. Hill. Your client's had $800,000 of principal. She's failed to make $420,000 payments of interest, late fees, and so on. So um, she's had those money. She must owe it to somebody. You say it can only be FBG. Yes. I'm, I'm, not, so, I'm not so sure of my answer in relation to the security. But I, I do say, I, we, we, we don't say we owe the money to nobody. We owe the money FBG, to is a, FBG is a wholly owned subsidiary 
of the respondent. Yes. But that's a separate personality. And they should have been, if they're, if they're the plaintiff, then they should be the plaintiff. It's, it's not a, it's a technical well, no point, doubt Mr. McCosker would say he didn't join them because that's premised on a construction of the ATA that he doesn't agree with. Yes. And, well, it could be an alternative, but uh, they could be joined for the purposes of the, uh, it, was, it was a suggestion made by the Chief Justice at one of the hearings. Yeah, but Mr. McCosker didn't feel that it had merit. He, he's advising FBG, it's up to them if they want to join in. Yes. Um, they have not decided to join in. And if it's found that the agreement is not enforceable, as I suggest, then they would have to commence proceedings again for their money. Well, my Lord's, again, apologies for the interjection, but wouldn't it, thinking out loud, the court would have to find more than that the agreement was unenforceable because uh, my friend's client is not, is not privy to that agreement. The court would have to find that that agreement was illegal. No, no they just have to find it was unenforceable and then not enforce its consequences. And its consequences would be the transfer of whatever it said to transfer. But you do say at various points that the agreement was illegal. Uh, I, I do, because of its effect, of, but it, it is contrary to the Companies Act. Well, sorry, which provision of the Companies Act? It's quite a big act. Um, I, the, the, the provisions that relied on by the Chief Justice as it happens, the, the insolvency provisions, they are transactions which would render the company insolvent. And be a, there, they, they, there would be a preference against the... Uh, an attempt to defeat the claims of depositors. It's very curious because you say that the transaction is illegitimate because FBG is assigning assets um, uh, 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 but remains um, with the liabilities. Whereas what you say the position results is that FBG has the asset uh, of a claim against Miss Venturi's, but no security. And if she's got no money, that may be an asset which is worth nothing at all. Could be, I'm, I'm not so sure about my answer in relation to security. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't. Right. Well, I put open brackets, perhaps close brackets in my note. Yes, well, the, but the, certainly it would have that effect. In terms of, it would just be a, a, an unsecured claim on the well, loan that's what I thought you Yes. But hence my observation that doesn't look very good for FBG. The transaction is unlawful because they're left in a, in a, a bad position if it takes effect. But if you're right, they have an unsecured claim against a lady whom you say can't pay anyway. Correct. Hmm. But who would have an asset in the, in the shape of the, they would just be pari passu and it might not be, they, they might get less, but they would get, yes, quite they still have something to enforce against. The, but that's yes, not her fault, yes. that's, that's the consequence of having it to the no, I follow, I follow. Yeah. Ill considered. Yes, okay. And I say that that's, that is, there is a reason, that there is um, a reasonable probability of success on the construction point. Right. <laughs> a reasonable what? Probability. Probability. Yes. Right. I believe I have my formulation correct that time. Yes. Okay. Just, can you help me on a, a number of, uh, are, are you coming to, to an end of your submissions or are you going on to Well, I, I, if, you, if your Lordship has a question, I'm happy to answer it. Well, I, yes. Um, there is a reference uh, to, this, uh, to a suggestion uh, that the um, ATA was a forgery. 
No, my lord, we don't. We don't. You did, what you we did say, say that. You did no, say we that. don't. I mean, and we don't need to because all we say is um, that the evidence was sworn that no relevant documents existed. Yeah, don't tell me that again. No, hang on, hang on I'll just come to that. That, that, that. It was sworn on date X, and a date after X, it's found to exist. So it, it could, it, its provenance was never pro properly made clear. But I don't need to say that it's a forgery, and I, and I, and I don't. Right. It. Okay. Um. Right. Um, just look at my, oh yes. Um, uh, um, there are um, a, whole, a, a number of matters alleged in your skeleton. Um, which the, the, the significance of which now I do not wholly follow. Um, if you go um, to page paragraph, I know which one is, um, uh, Yes, if you go to paragraph 60, well, it's very confusing because I was about to say paragraph 62 and couldn't find it. That is because paragraph 62 in your skeleton follows paragraph 93 um, and is to be found at page 23. Um, Because uh, paragraph 63, uh, you say, should the matter be remitted, it may well be preferable that the question of breach of duty and or clean hands be left for determination by the trial judge. Um, I mean, we're not at that stage now because either the appeal is not going to go ahead or it is going to go ahead and um, these matters can be determined if it goes ahead. Yes. Okay, I, I accept that. I can ignore that. Yes, I was I, one, of, one of the possibilities that might have been open to your lordship, if you had been with me, that the, the nature of the failure of disclosure was sufficiently severe, and the, the, the state of the pleadings it, 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 inept to deal with the question of the true construction of the agreement. That, that that might have required that to be repaired and for there to be a trial of that issue. But that does not appear to be the course that your Lordship has been taking. And so that can be that that can that can be ignored. And then there are a whole series of, of paragraphs um, from 64 onwards, which seems to be dealing with the supposed failure of the respondent to provide a redemption figure. Yes, that's the clean hands point. If we were going to go through the clean hands point today, that would, but we are apparently not. So again, that's... The, Sorry, the could you repeat that, Mr. Hill? Are, are, you, are you saying that the bank um, is not entitled to an equitable remedy because it doesn't have clean hands? Correct. Uh, can I then, I'm at risk of interrupting my Lord President. <laughs> Um, but uh, can I put it to you that neither does your client have clean, clean hands because yes. she secured this mortgage um, from FBG on the basis of a false representation uh, that she was in good standing with her prior lender, Capital G. Yes. And that was a matter which the Chief Justice referred to in paragraph uh, 95 of his judgment. Yes. Uh, and he pointed out um, that she had told FBG that she was, quote, current with the repayments with capital G, and she accepted in cross-examination that that information was untrue. Correct. But, so it doesn't sit very well with her to complain about the other side coming 
uh, to court without clean hands, well, does it? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the doctrine of clean hands is a test of whose hands are the cleanest. If you don't have clean hands yourself, then you can't rely on the equitable, the equitable relief. And uh, we say that capital G do not have clean hands. We don't, we don't suggest for a minute that our hands are the, the, the shiniest on the island, but uh, the, cause, the cause of the failure uh, of the legal mortgage was capital G's improper failure to provide the reconveyance. That they took the proceeds of the mortgage from FVG, kept them, and then for the sake of $4,000, refused to deliver up the reconveyance. If they weren't going to deliver the reconveyance, they shouldn't have kept the money that was given them. That was improper. It was given to them for a purpose. They didn't uh, do what it said on the tin. They kept the money and the uh, legal title. And but they were, uh, they were out of pocket to the extent of $4,000 because they'd made a, an insurance payment. And you're saying yes. they should just have swallowed that loss? No, we say, well, we say they, the, 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 the question of the insurance, we, the, we say that the redemption figure was provided by capital G. The money was given to them by attorneys for FBG for the purpose of redeeming that mortgage. It was improper to them keep to... the money and not provide the reconveyance. Right. If they weren't going to provide the reconveyance, they should have returned the check and said, could you please send us a bigger one? They should not have kept the money and then said, oh, by the way, you're not getting a reconveyance. And in that sense, they did not have clean hands. And now that it's convenient for them to, 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 to want to bring to life uh, some kind of mortgage because they acquired this mortgage in this transaction, allegedly, uh, but they, they, it would be improper to let them do so because they simply do not have clean hands. And the fact that we don't have clean hands either. This is hopeless. They've provided that. the conveyance. They've provided the reconveyance. Five years, four years later. Yeah. But they, that it was their, their failure to provide the reconveyance that prevented legal title. They, they're taking the first legal mortgage. The only reason I follow they that, but they, yes. they have cured that. They have washed their hands on the assumption they were ever desk in the first place. Well, I, I, uh, well, um, was this point argued below? Yes. Why does it not? Appear, are you sure it doesn't appear in the judgment? Uh, yes, he deals with the clean hands. It's the last thing he attends to. Yes, but it doesn't deal with this bit. Show me where he deals with it. Well, the, the, the bit that he does deal with the clean hands deals with this bit. This is the point that I made to him. Right. That's Page 170, paragraph rather, 171 of the judgment. Where the Chief Justice said he was oh, unable to accept the submission. Oh, I see. Yes, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. You're quite right, I'm wrong. Right, that's, un that's that aspect of unclean hands. Um, then... Uh, Oh, I see. And that's all dealt with, is it, in your paragraph 71 uh, to yes, 80. It's the same point. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, right. If, well, if, your Lordship's, if your Lordship's find that there was a valid uh, transfer of the rights and obligations under the equitable mortgage by virtue of the assignment, the confirmation and the asset transfer agreement, and that the clean hands argument doesn't affect their right to an equitable mortgage, which wouldn't change their position in terms of the money judgment. They'd still be entitled to a money judgment, but they just wouldn't be secured. Then I don't demur from what Mr. McCosker says about the consequences of that. That is what happens if they have an equitable mortgage they're entitled to possession, they're entitled to a money judgment and all the rest of it. Those are really the points of our appeal that the learned, the learned Chief Justice got it wrong in relation to the document. He shouldn't have let it in. Having let it in, he's wrong about its construction. That the effect of the construction is 
that the court won't enforce it, which means they simply stand back and the chips fall where they lie. Uh, and then uh, the doctrine of clean hands simply touches upon whether or not they're entitled to any security at all. And I say there's a reasonable probability of success on each of the, on, on certainly the second, the, the points two and three, uh, I, your, your lordships have made fairly clear what you think about point number one. Uh, I disagree with it. Perhaps I'm a stickler about lists of documents, uh, but those are my submissions. And that she yes. should be allowed, and that she's a poor person. Um, right. If, if in fact all these documents, the asset transfer agreement um, and the assignment and the confirmation are valid instruments, is there not in fact in the events which have happened a legal mortgage? Um, on the date that the mortgage was entered into, Mrs. Ventures didn't have legal title to convey to the bank. Yes. Um, now, capital G, once they'd worked out what had gone wrong, quickly tried to remedy that by delivering the reconveyance. But by that time, it was too late. If she didn't have it at the time, she conveyed her interest. And in fact, the capital G, the, the plaintiff have abandoned their claim to a legal mortgage. But they did so, so uh, and relied solely on an equitable mortgage, solely for the purpose of maintaining the trial date, as I understand. That, that's correct. Yes. Well, I follow all that, but what, what is actually, leave aside what stance anybody took, the position now is and, and has been for some time that Clarion uh, is the mortgagee and has the legal title to the property. Why is that's hence my question? Why is it not the case that in the events which have happened, namely those which I've just described, Clarion is now the legal mortgagee? Because there was no legal mortgage was created at the date, what's that, the 1st of February 2010. Because Can an equitable mortgage not mature into a legal mortgage? It would have to be inchoate in some. Have to be a what? It would have to be a sort of inchoate mortgage that came to, that I would say no. But it was not somebody, somebody, who has, argued. somebody who has pure, a purely equitable title can have a legal title. An assignee, one, yes. an assignee of a debt of which no notice has been given to the debtor has an equitable interest in the debt. But yes. so soon as the notice is given to the debtor, he has a legal interest. Yes, and that might be, there's not something that was argued, my lord. Uh, forgive me, I'm not actually interested in, in whether it was argued. Uh, um, I'm interested in whether it's correct. I don't know the answer. That's no, the okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, would it be convenient to, to take a, a break now? Yes, by the way. Can you just wait for a moment? I'd like to go into a, a breakout room with my um, colleagues um, in order to talk about timing. Um, could we go into uh, is, is Quelo around? We, yes. we can go straight into the breakout room, I think. Yes, please. Yes. yes. And go away. What do we do? I think, I think that we're just to wait until the appeal judges come back from their breakout, maybe a minute or two.
bite. Um, if it's convenient, we are minded to adjourn until half past 12. Yes, my lords. All right. See you all at half past 12. Thank you. Should we stay um, muted and videoed so that we just come back? Is that the way it works, Mr. Coelho? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, 12.30 it is. And no further discussion in breakout room required, Christopher. I think Christopher's gone. I think he's gone over already, but yeah. the judges should go to the breakout room.
Right, I think we're all assembled. Uh, Mr. McCosker. Yes, thank you, my Lord. Uh, just for a uh, matter of housekeeping, um, I anticipate that my submissions will take may, perhaps 20 minutes. Right. Right. Um, so, my Lord, uh, uh, of course, we're all aware that the appeal has been dismissed, and it was dismissed because the appellant failed to comply with uh, the registrar's orders requiring her to pay this court's costs and, and modest security for costs of the appeal um, to the respondent. And in fact, the uh, beyond uh, mere default in, in, in paying those costs and security costs, the, the appellant hadn't complied with any of the procedural requirements of that order. So procuring a transcript, filing skeleton arguments on time. Um, my friend's application is therefore, his application in chief, uh, is therefore his notice of motion under Order 2, Rule 17.4, the Court of Appeal Rules. Uh, and as my Lord um, observed before, in order for the appeal to be restored, Order 17, Rule 4 requires that there be good and sufficient cause to do so. I'll come to the meaning of that momentarily. Uh, of course, we also have um, the appellant's poor person's application pursuant to Order 2, Rule 33. And we know, of course, the test there is that this court must be satisfied the appellant's appeal has a reasonable probability of success, which of course means it's more likely than not to succeed. There's really only two points that I would like to address the court on. <clears throat> and, and the first point is the complaints in relation to how the asset transfer agreement. This has been characterized by the appellant. Because you faded out. Um... Yes. My apologies. Can, can you can you hear me? Now? I can now. Yes. Yes, but I wonder if you could repeat uh, what you said in relation to the ATA. Yes. So that's the first of the two substantive points I wish to make. Um, the the complaint that the asset transfer agreement came um, before the court or, or before the appellant as some sort of of ambush or as a failing in its discovery obligations, in the respondent's discovery obligations. So, as your lordships are of course aware. Uh, Order 24 of, of our RSC, based on the old English rules, um, imposes upon litigants a duty to disclose all relevant documents. And the, the, the scope of that test is, uh, is all documents relevant to the matters in question between the parties. And how do we answer that test? We look at the content of the pleadings and uh, responses to any further and better particulars. Now, in the appellant's appeal, which has been dismissed, the appellant makes allegations which were not pleaded uh, and they were raised only in the lead up to the first instance trial and that express allegation is that the amalgamation between first bermuda group limited and capital g bank limited now clarion on 30 september 2011 10 years ago was was a scheme designed to rob fbg's depositors of 175 million dollars and because the, the appellant was not uh, a party to those contractual arrangements, she, she's attacked them under the doctrine of illegality. And, and I, I need to pause at that juncture because the merger between FBG and, Cap, uh, FBG and Capital G was not an issue on the pleadings. It, it wasn't an issue that the Chief Justice was, was asked to rule upon. And um, if your Lordships have the first instance judgment to hand, the Chief Justice actually makes that clear at page three of his ruling. Because, and that's, I believe it's um, paragraph six, where the Chief Justice recites the issues that were before him for determination. And they are, as you'd expect, the issues are, did FBG hold an equitable mortgage? Was the mortgage and the loan properly assigned? Are the, the appellant's claims in relation to the 2005 loan time barred? And then there's the, the whole universe of allegations about uh, duties of care, who they might be owed to and what the content was. So I think it's tolerably clear that 
the asset transfer agreement between two merger parties wasn't relevant to those issues. It had nothing to do with whether the appellant paid her mortgage, whether that mortgage had been assigned, because that assignment was, of course, dealt with in the deed of assignment and deed of confirmation, which are undoubtedly relevant and were naturally discovered. And, and so having said that, I do need to explain to your Lords how this document came to be placed in a witness statement. Um, Just a moment. Um, wasn't the ATA relevant to the question whether the 2010 loan had been properly assigned? My Lord, I, I don't think so at all. Um, the, the 2010 loan was assigned by way of the uh, deed of assignment, and there were some issues with that document, and a deed of confirmation rectified the, uh, those issues. The, not the ATA? Not the ATA. The ATA is merely, and I'm come, I will come to, to address you on the specific provisions of the ATA, but the ATA <laughs> was, was an agreement by which the balance sheet of one bank was transferred to a new bank. Uh, I, I, certainly the respondent's view is that it has nothing to do with the validity of an assignment of an equitable mortgage. Now, I think my friend takes a different view. Sorry, that wasn't my question. Um, the loan um, was, um, I mean, the loan itself was not assigned pursuant to the assignment, the deed of assignment. If you look at the deed of assignment, the deed of assignment assigns. Bear with me. Um, the deed of assignment, which is at uh, page six hundred and forty-nine provides that in paragraph one, that the assignor unconditionally, et cetera, assigns all its right in and to the contract. Uh, the contract is what is um, defined in schedule one. And if you look at schedule one, it is the mortgage deed. Yes. And, and the mortgage, part of the mortgage is of course an obligation to repay. The mortgage itself has a provision expressly permitting it to be assigned. So, and we have to remember, of course, that this was uh, ultimately the case that the respondent advanced at first instance was in rely what well, was an equitable mortgage claim. And as your lordship will be aware, that the, the beginning of, a, of an equitable mortgage claim is uh, possession of the continuous possession of the title deeds to the property. Mm -hmm. And during the hearing. Uh, the only, and again, I, I apologize that I, ha I cannot refer you to a transcript, but the only subject matter on which uh, I chose to re-examine Mr. Fiella was to confirm the unbroken chain of custody of the title deeds from First Bermuda Group to Capital G, sorry, from Capital G to First Bermuda Group back to Capital G and what is now known since its rebranding as Clarion. So on the equitable mortgage point, the, the equitable mortgage arises by virtue of the continued possession of those title deeds since 2005. Yes. Um, well, I quite follow it's the point I put to um, Mr. Hill <laughs> that the mortgage deed has an obligation to repay. Um, and it might therefore be thought that all you need is the, the deed of assignment. Um, if, however, you had foreseen what the Chief Justice was <laughs> later to decide, namely that the deed of assignment was ineffective because the common seal of the two companies had not been applied to the assignment, that was solved um, insofar as the uh, conveyance of, of um, the land was concerned. Well, well the, um, the deed of confirmation um, confirmed the assignment of the freehold property. Yes. Um, 
but the deed of confirmation uh, didn't deal with the assignment uh, of actually either the, the mortgage or the loan. Um, the deed of confirmation dealt with the conveyance of the property. So that in fact, in the events which have happened, the instrument which affected the assignment of the loan was the ATA. Well, if we have an equitable mortgage, uh, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if I have the answer to your, to your question, my lord, I'm not going to... Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I can agree with that, that proposition, yeah. and if I may respectfully explain why. The, um, and it's a bit complicated in this case because we proceeded on by, by reason of an equitable mortgage, but the equitable mortgage um, carries with it an obligation to repay in, in terms of, it, it's a bit strange talking about assignment of an equitable mortgage, but in this case, we had Mr. Fiala's evidence of a chain of custody over a title deed. We also had a vault record um, confirming that the, uh, the title deeds remained in possession of what was then the plaintiff um, for the whole relevant period. Um, the equitable mortgage carries with it an obligation to repay. Um, so, so my respectful submission would be that the, if, the, if we operate under the assumption that the asset transfer agreement never existed, it's a much simpler state of affairs. Yes. Um, I, I don't think that I can, respectfully, I don't think that I can agree with you that the, the obligation to repay wouldn't have been, wouldn't still lie with the appellant and owed to the respondent. Well, wait a moment. The obligation to repay um, was contained in the mortgage deed. Yes. But the mortgage deed was not effectively assigned by the deed of assignment that purported to do so. So the Chief Justice held. So the Chief Justice held. Uh, you, I, I agree you'd have to be quite recondite to pick this point up. But you, you, you were saying that the ATA had nothing to do with the assignment of the loan, um, which one would be tempted to think is correct, um, unless one knew that the purported assignment was ineffective. And, and, and my Lord, <clears throat> the, my understanding is that the, um, and, and I may be missing the, um, the subtlety in your, your position, <laughs> but and I apologize if I am, but the deed of confirm the, the, the Chief Justice did, of course, find that due to a, uh, an execution issue, the deed of assignment was not effective. Yeah. He found that the deed of confirmation was effective to remedy the issues in relation to the deed of assignment. So in terms of obligation to repay, as of the, execu the proper execution of the deed of confirmation in 2014 and onwards, then the obligation to repay has been um, properly, or, or to receive repayments, properly held by the respondent. Perhaps your, your, your point is that on your Lordship's um, interpretation of how the obligation to repay uh, is transferred, that on that interpretation, the ATA could be relevant to the matters in question between the parties. Is, is, is that your Lordship's point? Well, you, you say that the obligation following the, the deed of confirmation, the obligation to repay is um, held um, by the respondent, but uh, that would be fine if the deed of confirmation confirmed the deed of assignment, but it doesn't. Um, what it um, does is to confirm the ownership of the freehold properties. Yes, uh, but if we return to the concept of, of an equitable mortgage and, and yes. talking about assigning an equitable mortgage is a bit of a um, like an academic point because our case at first instance and the law uh, the chief justice was addressed on at length on the law as to equitable mortgages um, is that it essentially uh, stemmed from continued possession of the title deeds uh, in this case there was a defect uh, in the conveyance which is part of the reason why the uh, 
the respondent didn't advance a legal mortgage claim. It didn't want to have to fight that out over a number of days. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it wasn't a real point of contention that an well, certainly the Chief Justice found that had no, little difficulty in finding that an equitable mortgage arose. The terms of that equitable mortgage were informed by the contents of the deed of mortgage. Uh, that that document contained a an obligation to repay, mm -hmm. and that it had been in the continuous custody of the respondent and its former uh, entities for the entire 15 year at the time, um, tenure of the, of the dispute between the parties. I think that the asset transfer agreement, and I'll, I'll accept, is the mechanism by which the debt itself is transferred. But on the respondent's reading of the pleadings, the respondent formed a view that that, that wasn't relevant to the matters in question between the parties. Mm. Um, Sorry, the deed that had been in, in the continuous possession of capital G and then FBG is, is you mean the deed of mortgage? I do, my lord. Yes. Yes. Uh, I thought at one stage you used the expression title deeds, which I didn't I, know. I, I, I did. And, and, um, the, the, but you didn't that, mean it? No, I didn't mean it. The, the, the deed, of mor deed of mortgage was, was in the continuous yes. possession. Yes, uh, yes. Which is, well, that, I understand that. It, I didn't understand what you meant when you said what you didn't mean to say. I, I apologize, my lord. Um, okay. The, if I may, I, I, I was, um, I was going to explain to the court uh, if if I'm now before you submitting that this document isn't relevant, then a, a question that your lords would be um, right to ask is well why is it in a witness statement, and and I, if I may I'd, I'd like to address you on that, um, and if I may do so um, by reference to the the correspondence which appears in the record. If, if your lords have it in front of you, perhaps we could start at page 312. Yes. So the, the respondent's position, um, and I, I take your, your lord, lordship's questions uh, in relation to this on notice, of course, but the, lord, the, the respondent's position remains that this document was not relevant to the matters in question between the parties. And so this email that you have before you is on the 13th of February, 2020, 2.49 um, a.m. And just to contextualize the email, um, at 9.30 a.m. on that morning of, um, of 13 February was the hearing of a summons by the respondent seeking to have the matter finally set down for trial because the matter had been stalled for approximately 12 months. The, the appellant had outstanding applications for leave to adduce expert evidence um, and a, a forensic email discovery process. And what the respondent had eventually elected to do in order to get the trial on was to consent to both of those applications. That's just to contextualize um, the email. But um, <clears throat> at the bottom of page 312, the, the penultimate paragraph begins with the word secondly. And um, this is where the appellant for the first time begins to assert that details of the bank's merger and acquisition activity are relevant. The appellant's the clarion is not the successor in title to FBG, plainly relevant, but of amalgamation. And if you could keep pointing towards your microphone, we can't hear you when you turn away. I, I, thank you, thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, Essentially, my lord, the, the point I wish to make by reference to this penultimate paragraph is that um, this is the first occasion, as the point wasn't taken in pleadings, that the appellant began to contend that M&A documents about merger and acquisition activity dating all you know, decades and decades and decades were relevant to the question, the questions which were before the court. So he, uh, he states, we therefore require sight of the corporate and regulatory documents that are said to have achieved the various mergers and amalgamations. There may even be a continuation of a BVI company into Bermuda. Now at the time, the respondent was of the view that these are not relevant on the pleadings to the matters in question between the parties, but the request started to be made at that point. Um, the appeal proceeds on the 13th of February, the matter is set down for trial. And at that hearing, the appellant's counsel um, made the same point to the judge that he wanted to see the corporate records of the respondent dating back almost a century. And, and the judge wasn't particularly impressed with that submission. Uh, perhaps the best evidence of that might be um, my, my friend's own email. If we could turn to page 330. Sorry. 
So this is an email some four days later, still in February of 2020. Um, and as you'll see, the, the, the Appellants Council, we're, we're making some arrangements for inspection of documents. And, and the request for corporate documents is repeated. He says, in addition, we would very much like to see the corporate documents that gave effect to the various amalgamations through which the plaintiff entity has passed beginning with Regent Investments. Our client believes the present plaintiff is not the successor in title to the original mortgagee, and there is no evidence the original mortgagee provided the funds advanced. This matter needs to be cleared up, even if, as the judge suggested, it is unmeritorious, a comment he would have done well to keep to himself for obvious reasons. So the respondent's view at the time was that these documents were not relevant and the Chief Justice had made a similar indication. If we, if we could move ahead, to, there's one other email I would like to, to address your Lordships on, um, at page 369 of the bundle. It should be, if I could, without interrupting for too long, that was the hearing at which the Chief, the learned Chief Justice suggested that FBG be joined as a plaintiff. He, he asked the question, um, my recollection is that he asked the question of whether it could be joined as a plaintiff, and my submission was that it could be, because it remains a, 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 an active entity, his government fees are being paid, and it's a fully owned subsidiary of the respondent to these proceedings, and, and, and we determined not to join them as it was unnecessary. Um, yes. Sorry. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, you see that he was caught on, on, on page three of the There was an email from uh, myself to uh, the appellant. I have not heard from you for some time. So where are we looking at? Uh, halfway down the, the page 369, an email from myself to Mr. Hill, 4th of March. Yes. I have not heard from you for some time. As you are aware, witness statements were due to be exchanged on Monday. Can you please confirm you are now ready to exchange? If we go back two pages to page 367, this is Mr. Hill's response. I'd like to start at the very bottom right of page 367 yes. because the request for corporate documents is repeated. Mr. Hill, there's some debate about costs and, um, and such. And then it begins, once this one is finished over the page 368, Sorry, three, six, six. Right, got it. Three, Thank six, you. eight. There will be one, and the reference is to a, a potential application. There will be one about your missing documents. So you would be well advised to get the affidavit referred to in the rule sorted. You'd better make sure it is true because if I find a document that has not been disclosed, for example, by a reference to it in a document that has been disclosed, then there will be trouble. And the, 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 the wording of that email is, Is that Mr. Mikowska, <coughs> sorry, yes. when, when you turn away, um, we can't hear you at all, so you obviously I, have to be close to the mic. I apologise. I, I, the, the point I wish to make is that the, the language in Mr. Hill's email is interesting. Um, if we find a document that has not been disclosed, there will be trouble. If you could turn to page um, paragraph 23 of the appellant's skeleton. on page six of the appellant's um, skeleton argument. Yes. And, and what the appellant says here is a belief that there must be additional documents beyond the deed of assignment and deed of confirmation that which evidence the transaction, confirm compliance with capital ratios and other important considerations. This belief caused repeated requests for documents to be made of the respondents the very terms of the deed of assignment referred to another contract into which the parties had entered. Now, the only point that I wish to make um, here, my lords, um, the respondent's view was that the full century old history of, of the respondent's m &A activity was not relevant on the pleadings, but nevertheless, a decision was made, fateful one, as it turns out, to refer to, to include the asset transfer agreement in the witness statement of Mr. Fiella, which we proposed to exchange with the appellant at the beginning of March, 2020. 
it's not a secret, it's not a fabrication, um, it's not something that's been withheld. I should now just briefly address the interpretation of the asset transfer agreement itself. Just, just, um, just, um, yeah, do that. But just for a moment, um, in paragraph 23, he says the very terms of the deed of assignment referred to another contract into which the parties had entered. I don't follow that. The, what, what, is, what is referred to there? Is that right? I, I believe, um, with the benefit of hindsight, that, that my friend is actually referring to the asset transfer agreement. Well, he may be, but um, where in the deed of assignment is a reference to what turns out to be the asset transfer agreement? Perhaps my friend might be best placed to assist. <laughs> Can you find me where it is? Um, his Lord, the Chief Justice refers to it as well, by the way. Well, well what's the answer, Mr. Hill? I'm not interested in how, whoever else has referred to it. If it's in the no. deed of assignment, you can show it to me in the deed of assignment. Very well. Let me, I'll take it off. Where's the deed of assignment? Ben can remind me where that is again. 649. I, I took that uh, with the benefit of hindsight from the assigner has agreed to assign the contract to the assignee and the asset transfer agreement refers to entering into uh, other uh, of, of, of creating the other documents which will give effect. defined in schedule one as appears from the immediately preceding line. And no, I'm, I'm talking about um, the, the, the recital, whereas B. I know, it's what, exactly what I was referring to. Do, do listen. B says the assignor has agreed to assign the capital C contract to the assignee. In A, there is a definition of the capital C contract. Yes. And it's schedule one to the deed. Schedule one to the deed is the mortgage deed. Correct. Uh, but so I it's not a reference the, to some other agreement. No, no. The, the agreement to assign that contract is contained in the asset transfer agreement in which it says, in order to give effect to this agreement, other documents may have to be executed and we'll do that. And this document is therefore created in order to give effect to the asset transfer agreement. That's a different point. Yeah, well, that was the point doing? I was attempting to make. Well, that you, this, uh, this, that you... this contract, this, this assignment makes reference to another agreement by which the assignor and the assignee agreed to enter into the assignment. But it doesn't. Well, that's what I took whereas B to mean. And that's what the Chief Justice took it to mean as well. I can't believe it. You'll have to show me where he did that. On the assumption that we all speak English, B is obviously referring, when it uses the term contract, is using it as a defined term in the immediately preceding subparagraph. That was the last point that I wish to make about, I, I simply wish to explain to the court why the asset transfer agreement was included in the witness statement. The respondent's view remains that it was not relevant, but the appellant's counsel had been um, asking for documents in relation to the, to the merger. Now, obviously it's, it's apparent to all of us that um, a merger of this scale is going to have a number of constituent documents. That does not mean that those are relevant to the question of an assignment of a mortgage. But if, if I, um, I do need to address uh, your Lordships on the actual ATA itself. Yes. Um, yes. So my, my friend has contended for an interpretation which 
uh, being diplomatic, I, I believe is strained. The, the Chief Justice was a little bit more blunt. He, he said that that interpretation was commercially nonsensical, would produce entirely perverse results, but we should probably pick it apart. And my Lords, the, the, the document appears at page 200 of the record. It does indeed. So the first point I want to address uh, was also the first point that my friend made, which is the notation on the cover. Oh, yeah. Per, per Brian Myrie, not to be copied to misventures. Now, Mr. Myrie was the general counsel of Clarion up until, I believe, um, 2015, well before the discovery exercise in these proceedings was undertaken. And I would simply recount from memory of the evidence that Mr. Fiella gave um, when the Chief Justice asked about this. And that was that the appellant had been attending at the offices of the respondent bank unannounced on various occasions asking to examine all manner of documents. Now, naturally, she is entitled to examine the deeds that the bank holds, other documents in relation to her mortgage, but this document was, uh, was not relevant to those issues and she did not have an entitlement to it. I just want to, wouldn't want the, um, I believe that my friends made the assertion that it has anything to do with discovery obligations, which I would, I would simply say is not the case. Um, there are only three points that I want to make about this document. <clears throat> the first is, into, is to do with the definition of assets, and that appears on page 202. Mm -hmm. And my, my friend's point, if I'm understanding it um, correctly, is that there is an ambiguity in the definitions of assumed liabilities and excluded liabilities. And I would concede readily that um, I would have drafted this document differently, but I would say that it's tolerably clear that the party's intentions were to transfer the balance sheet. And that's why the balance sheet was a schedule to the agreement. It, it appears at page 209. And what was to take place was that the balance sheet of the, uh, the old entity would be transferred to the balance sheet of the new entity. But if we adopt for argument's sake, my friend's interpretation, there, there is, and we're talking about theoreticals here, I'll come to tell you what actually happened, which is also instructive. Um, one point that my friend doesn't address is the indemnity. So at section 6.2, which is page 206 of the record. Yes. I, I believe the contention is that all of FBG's assets were transferred and all of its liabilities were, were left hanging. Um, but certainly how I read uh, the indemnity is that the respondent, what was then known as capital G, has fully indemnified and held FBG harmless in respect of any claims in connection with the transfer of the business. So my friend's kind of public interest point uh, is relevant. If a depositor did have some claim against FBG arising out of the transfer, then FBG would be fully indemnified by the respondent. And, and as I mentioned before, FBG is an active entity. It has a shell nothing on its balance sheet, and it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the respondent, Clarion Bank Limited. And my third and final point in relation to this document, my Lords, is that not only was it the intention of the parties to transfer the balance sheet, but I'm instructed that that's actually what happened. All of the assets and the liabilities, which appear at Schedule 1, were transferred to what is now the respondent. So, while the story that the appellant puts forward about a merger between banks where one bank defrauds the depositors of another uh, is interesting academically, it's, it's pure fiction. And, and my respectful submission is that it, it's a last ditch obligation, a last ditch effort to um, evade obligations under the mortgage. Can we just look at... Um the evidence as to what actually happened as regards the transfer of assets and liabilities? Yes, my Lord, there is no evidence before the court. Um, and that is because it's a very good question to ask. And uh, it's why I was careful with my language that it was on instruction that I can make that submission to you today. Um, however, the issue uh, of the merger was 
certainly on the respondent's view, not relevant to uh, the issues before the court and therefore didn't form any part of its evidence. So I can make that point as a matter of submission only with instructions. Um, they're the two substantive points I wish to make, but if we return to the legal test. Uh, well, wait a moment. I'm afraid if that's the only ones you want to make, you're going to have to deal with the ones that I'd like you to answer. Of, of course. I apologise, my lord. Um, <laughs> let me I also say that paragraph 155 of the Chief Justice's ruling, uh, where he finds that the... He says the deed of assignment is dated 30th September, the same date as the asset transfer agreement. In the recital, it is recorded that the assigner is a party to a contract with the person, the borrower, as identified in Schedule 1. And then the assigner has agreed to assign the contract to the assignee. And then he says the reference to the agreement to assign is a reference to Clause 2.3 of the asset transfer agreement. So the reference to the agreement to assign is a reference to the asset transfer agreement in the recitals. Just a moment. Oh, I see. So I'm not sure the view expressed in that paragraph 26 is, is quite as, as ridiculous as your Lordship may have implied. Yeah. And in my learned friend's own submission, he says that the asset transfer agreement is part of a suite of documents which give effect to the, the intention of the parties. Yes. yes, I see. I see what is put. Well, that makes more sense than I had previously perceived. Right. Um, but coming back to the asset transfer agreement, what the learned Chief Justice decided was that there was a transfer of liabilities by reason of the provisions of Clause 2.1. Yes. In consideration of the transfer of the assets, the transferee shall pay all costs associated with the ongoing maintenance of the transferor in compliance with applicable laws. Um, and um, that was his conclusion. Two points. If that stood alone, it would have um, the greatest strength. Though, if this was intended to be a transfer of the balance sheet, it's very curiously drafted so as to refer to a transfer of assets without referring specifically to liabilities, uh, but using the phraseology, the ongoing maintenance of the transfer order. But leave that aside for the moment. When you look at paragraph 2.2, .2, what the transfer assigns is the assets. Um, and at paragraph 2.4, what is excluded from the transfer are the excluded liabilities. Yes. So um, the first question which I raised with Mr. Hill is, how is a liability an asset which falls to be excluded from the definition of assets? That's problem number one. Um, if one then goes to the definition of assets, what is the assets um, which are uh, to be transferred are every asset of the transferor include every asset of the transferor, the asset right and benefit of the transferor included in the balance sheet as set out in schedule one. Uh, 
as well as the assumed liabilities, um, goodwill, etc., and the records, which will exclude the excluded liabilities. So, curiously, the asset is to be, that is to be transferred is every asset, as well as the assumed liabilities. Very curious uh, phraseology. Um, but in any event, it's to exclude the excluded liabilities. And you then look at excluded liabilities over the page, and that means all the liabilities or obligations of or relating to the transfer transferor's business or assets other than the assumed liabilities. So what's to be excluded from the transfer are all the liabilities relating to the transferor's business, which would appear to be its obligations to the depositors at the moment of assignment. Other than the assumed liabilities, so one then sees what is the exclusion from the exclusion, and assumed liabilities means the rights and benefits of the transferor as at the date hereof in relation to the assets, but not noticeably the obligations of the transferor. Well, that's that's the worst the worst drafting error that is in this document. And I think yes. it's the drafting error or ambiguity, I think, would be a better way for me to address it. But the respondent's position when it comes to a matter of contractual interpretation between it and the and, and what was formerly FPG is that assumed liabilities, rights and benefits was meant to include the liabilities. <laughs> it is, it, I, I, I that's agree. That's a question of fact. Well, a question of, if this, is a matter of contractual, this is a matter of contractual interpretation and the actual, certainly in my respectful submission, the actual question is, is this document or is this transaction illegal? Um, the, or the, the, the most that I can assist the court with is, is by saying that the, the, the drafting is uh, less than ideal. Assumed liabilities was intended between the parties. If you look at what their intention was to transfer all of the liabilities, and that is actually what happened. And the indemnification under clause six, um, if this was some scheme to strand the liabilities at FBG level, then the, the effect of the indemnification provision is that uh, what is now Clarion, what is the respondent in this proceeding, would be on the hook in the end anyway. So if it was an intention to um, defraud depositors, then it's not a very effective one. Well, wait a moment. I can have a look at 6.2 again, because it doesn't seem to be uh, referred to by the Chief Justice in his judgment. He wasn't addressed on it, my lord. No, I see. Was he addressed on, on the problem about assets, excluded liabilities and assumed liabilities? My recollection is that the, um, to, is that the not in any great detail <laughs> by, by my friend, however, it was exhaustively addressed in my friend's improved submissions, which arrived seven days after the hearing. Right. Well, um, sorry, just going, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But coming back to 6.2, transfer shall assume all liability and obligation and hold harmless the transferor in respect of any old claims, obligations, and other liabilities arising out of. I think it begins about halfway through. Um, the trans about halfway down, the transferee shall indemnify and hold harmless the transferee, of course, being the respondent. Indemnify oh, and, and so hold. So where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Uh, about uh, um, one, seven or eight. Yes. Yes. Transferee shall indemnify and hold harmless the transfer or being FBG directors, officers, and so on against suits, proceedings, actions, claims, demands, costs, expenses, taken or made against or to be incurred or become payable by FBG, the transfer or, or any of its directors, in the course of or in connection with the transfer of the transfer, transfer or's business and assets to the transferee. My reading, my reading of that provision is that were a depositor to be defrauded, 
uh, and check their FBG bank account and find that it is empty, any suit against FBG in relation to that um, hypothetical fraud um, or wrongdoing would be subject to an indemnity from the respondent to these proceedings. And for completeness, I should add that this, this provision wasn't uh, before the Chief Justice. Um, it, it, it wasn't a, a, an enormous examination of this document. Um, but but I, I do believe that it causes real issues with my, my friend's uh, assertion that this somehow is the mechanism by which a fraud was perpetrated on FBG's depositors such that the Chief Justice ought to have found this contract illegal. What's the effect, Mr. McCosker, of the, the, the balance sheet um, essentially in, in encompassing both assets and liabilities, um, forming part of assets as defined? Um, if I'm understanding your Lord's question correctly, um, leaving aside the I think what we can all agree is, or what I would submit is sloppy drafting in the definition section. I was going um, to suggest that liabilities came in by virtue of the references to Schedule 1. Uh, yes, my Lord. The, the, I, I'm instructed that what actually happened, and I appreciate there's no evidence of this because it wasn't a matter in question between the parties, but what actually happened is the balance sheet that you see at page 209 was transferred and that FBG today is, it has a shell of a balance sheet and that it has de minimis or no assets or liabilities because they were transferred to the respondent pursuant to the asset transfer agreement. And immediately after transfer, uh, capital G's assets increased by 173 million and its liabilities increased by 174 million. I understand that's what happened, which is also what, what looking at this agreement and, and leaving to one side the difficult drafting, that's what this entire transaction was intended to achieve. Sorry, I'm, let, let's, yeah. Gosh. Um. But sorry, going back to 6.2. Yes. Shall it indemnify and hold harmless the transfer or against actions, etc., or, or claims which may be taken or made uh, or become payable by the transfer or? That's um, um, BG. BG. Um, in the course of or in connection with the transfer of the, or of the transferor's business. So, if the business of FBG, if the assets of FBG uh, were to be um, transferred um, without the obligation um, to pay, I suppose you could have a, a, a claim for some form of malfeasance. I think so. But if we also, my Lord, look at the definition of business, let's just remember that the, resp the appellant's contention is that this was an illegal transaction designed to defraud deposit holders. Yes. The definition of business on page 202 yes. means the, the business of deposit taking. Yes. So the indemnification is any claims in connection with the transfer of the transferor's business of deposit taking, 
which I would say is the liability to pay, mm. um, and assets, which has the difficult definitional issues which we looked at before, whatever claim, theoretical claim, let's, let's accept for the moment the appellant's argument that this was a fraud perpetrated on FBG's depositors. Um, if I've deposited $1,000 in FBG's bank, uh, bank account, it disappears. I sue FBG under the banking mandate or, or, or some other um, cause of action. Then I would say that this indemnification provision means that the respondent to these proceedings has indemnified FBG. Yes, I follow that. Okay. So you said that's another ground in addition, not found by the Chief Justice, but in addition um, to what he found at two point, what, what he found to be the construction of 2.1. Yes. Uh, um, but then let us go back to the difficult problem of assets. Um, let us assume uh, that assumed liabilities um, is in fact the liabilities of the transferor at the date hereof rather than the rights and benefits of the transferor. That has the overall effect that what is transferred are the assets as well as the assumed liabilities, uh, which on that footing um, would mean the liabilities to the depositors, but shall exclude the excluded liabilities. And if we look at excluded liabilities, that means all the liabilities relating to the transferor's business or assets. Um, now I see other than the assumed liabilities. It's, it's a terribly circular, I, I'm pleased to say that I'm, I was not involved in the drafting of it, but it's a terribly difficult to understand um, document. But the, respectfully, the question for the court is, um, is this, is this evidence of a fraudulent scheme? Um, obviously, if, there was, if this was a contract, if this was a dispute between FBG and capital G, hypothetically, um, about the meaning, then the court would go through the ordinary contractual interpretation process, look at maybe parole evidence or ancillary documents to determine what the intention of the parties were. But the question for this court, which really wasn't before the Chief Justice, was, is this an illegal transaction? Um, and you, you have my admittedly bare submission on instructions about what actually happened and what FBG is now. Um, but my submission is that if, if this document from 10 years ago evidences an intention to leave FBG with $175 million of liabilities and no assets, then it's hopelessly incapable of doing so because of the indemnity, because of the balance sheet, which it appears as a schedule. Um, I'm not could... concerned at the moment with whether or not this is a document that shows any form of iniquity. I'm interested in determining whether or not the Chief Justice was right to hold um, that it constitutes um, a, 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 an assignment in effect of the obligations of the transferor. And he says that is brought about uh, by paragraph 2.1. Yes. And you say that that is underlined by 6.2. But what it could be said is that 2.1 and 6.2 <laughs> need to be looked at in the context uh, of the overall provisions as to transfer of assets. Um, which appear to include a transfer of assumed liabilities, which aren't liabilities at all, and to appear to exclude uh, liabil liabilities relating to the transfer's business, uh, transferor's business, which are indeed the obligations to the depositor. I, respect, no, respectfully, my Lord, if we're simply concerned with the question of who had the right to bring this action? And I think the answer is quite simple, um, I hope. 
Um, section two, uh, which the Chief Justice relied on, is headed transfer of assets. And I think it's, I think it's tolerably clear if we look at the balance sheet at page 209, the, the loan account, the, the, there's an entry there, uh, account 1805 loan account FA. Yeah. I understand that that's the, um, that was FBG's um, loans, uh, mortgage loans, essentially, which is an asset of a bank, an obligation by those uh, mortgage jaws to repay. Yeah. So if we're, we, we've gone around in circles about illegality and fraud on deposit holders, I, I would respectfully submit that the Chief Justice was, was perfectly right when he found that a provision headed transfer of assets, which express, expressly transfers to, the, to what is now the respondent, an asset being all of the liabilities the mortgagors owe the bank. That should be the end of the question about standing. Well, I think it's, it's in one sense simpler than that. I have no difficulty in concluding that there was a transfer uh, of the obligation under the mortgage, because that's plainly part of the assets uh, and is um, part of the assets uh, as defined uh, and part of item 1805 in the balance sheet um, and uh, is um, transferred under 2.2. The relevant question, the relevant potential question is to deal with the illegality or, or um, um, Terpai Kaiser point that Mr. Hill seeks to make, which is that whilst there was an assignment of the asset, there was in fact no assignment of the obligations and therefore the whole thing is illicit and therefore the court should not lend its aid. So you don't need to persuade me that there's a transfer of the assets. What is perhaps less clear because of the far from clear, indeed obfuscatory drafting of the agreement is whether and precisely how the obligations were transferred when they feel, appear to fall neatly into the expression excluded liabilities. Because if the obligations to the depositors fall within the excluded liabilities, it might be thought to well, say, well, that doesn't matter because although they're expressly excluded as liabilities, uh, you get to the same result anyway uh, by some other clause. I think the, the, the most that I can do to assist the court with this drafting um, is, is first of all to uh, communicate uh, my understanding uh, and my instructions that the, the drafting is not obfuscatory, um, it is poor draftsmanship. But well, that's what poor to... drafting is. It leaves, it, it, it makes it unclear. Obfuscatory simply is a fancy word for saying unclear. Yes, my lord. I, I suppose obfuscatory might um, imply some intention to conceal no, something. But... No, I'm sure they intended to be as clear as possible. But... Yes, this was a very important transaction. Yes. Uh, there's only four banks in Bermuda. They don't merge very often. Quite. Um, so all, all that I can do to assist your lordship yes. in, in, in assessing whether the Chief Justice was correct is, is make the proposition that my major, major issue with the drafting here is the definition of assumed liabilities and that the, specifically on page 202, the phrase rights and benefits. Yeah. I'm asking the court respectfully to um, assume that the, the parties to this agreement <clears throat> who were entering into a, a, an amalgamation with one another, which was uh, a matter of public record, yeah. Uh, intended when they when the draftsman or draftswoman prepared that clause to transfer everything that you see on the balance sheet that appears at page two zero nine. It's, it's, the, it's the, the highest I can put it, my lord. But but I, I I do submit that that is the, um, the proper interpretation of what the parties intended, and to and I'm also instructed that that is what happened for what it's worth. Um, and it, it would require something quite extraordinary to, for the Chief Justice or for this court to find that this document is the smoking gun or the, the, the missing key to a $175 million fraud. Well, there are some cases on construction which 
say that when it's obvious that it must have meant something different, the court is entitled to say that it does. Uh, so yes. when, it's, when it says rights and benefits, and that's incoherent because neither a right nor a benefit is a liability, uh, it must mean liabilities or obligations. Uh, yes, of course, my Lord. And, and as a matter of interpretation, you would also look to the rest of the document outside of that definition, and we would look to the party's intentions. And, and my respectful submission would be, if the intention is to transfer assets and no liabilities, then why would, I mean, the effect of the indemnification clause is to, yeah. is to place the respondent on risk for the liabilities anyway. Yes, um, yes, definitely. Would, would be okay. my respectful submission. Well, I'm sorry to have detracted you, distracted you from some of that. No, no, my Lord. Uh, did you have, before I conclude, did you have any other questions in relation uh, to that document? Not on the ATA, no. But my Lord, I, I was intending to, to um, really draw my submissions to a close. It's essentially, there are three notices of motion before you. There is yeah. a, an application under Order 2, Rule 17.4, and that requires, if, if your Lord, I think that is, that is the most important um, motion before you, because this court would have to be satisfied that there is good and sufficient cause to restore this appeal. This appeal was dismissed some months ago, it was dis and the circumstances of it being dismissed are relevant. Uh, a entirely orthodox order for directions was made by the registrar at the beginning of the year. It was made by the registrar in the appellant's absence, um, not because the appellant had not received notice. There was a provision in that uh, order um, because, like I mentioned before, uh, the interaction between bar and bench at the uh, directions hearing, um, the appellant's counsel's absence was obviously a concern to the respondent, uh, to the uh, registrar. And so a provision was made for um, leave to apply um, uh, to restore those directions uh, if, if the appellant took issue with the, uh, the form of the directions. However, that's not what the appellant did. Um, the appellant didn't take issue with the directions which had been made, but then she, proceeded to not comply with any single one of them. Um, no transcript was produced. We, we know that no security for costs was paid. Various excuses were proffered. And in fact, in the record, there's an email from the appellant's counsel saying that he's happy to undertake to pay those fees, though that obviously never happened either. Um, we then had a, a, a somewhat maligned application before uh, Appeal Justice Bell uh, a month or so ago, which was crafted as an application under Order 5, Rule 1, but um, really in substance was, was trying to be an application under Order 2, Rule 33 for a poor person's application. Um, that was not granted because the material was not before the court in an acceptable state and the appellant failed to satisfy uh, his lordship that there was a reasonable possibility of success. Uh, and, and now we're here before the full court. Probability, I, I apologize. It's important that we, that we get that right. Um, and now we're here before the full court on a full day hearing. Um, my respectful submission in relation to the appellant's application to restore the appeal is that there is absolutely no good or sufficient cause why this appeal should be restored. And that's on two, um, it's, a, it's a contention I make on two grounds. One, um, if I may, kind of import the test from Order 2, Rule 33, um, which is the other application, one of the other applications my friend has on foot, which would require you to be to determine there was a reasonable probability of success, meaning better than 50%, more likely than not. Um, my submission is that this appeal has no reasonable possibility of success. It has no probability of success, I should add, but it also has no possibility of success. And moreover, the conduct of the appeal has been haphazard um, and perhaps might disincentivize the court from restoring the appeal because there is no good and sufficient cause. It's of some concern to the respondent to find out, um, if I may move on to the poor person's application, which really um, only comes into, um, into consideration were your lordships minded to restore the appeal. I would respectfully submit that it should not be done. The poor person's application, um, is premised upon an affidavit of the appellant in which she um, attests, 
both to her um, limited financial means. And I, I mentioned um, when I unfortunately interjected in my friend's submissions that the, um, the Chief Justice heard from the appellant at trial that she had, the exact wording was, some money set aside to pay her mortgage um, and that she wanted to simply make sure she paid the right mortgagee. Um, then we received a, a separate affidavit saying that she is of um, such limited means that she um, can't pay the security for costs. And on that juncture, I should pause and say, the appellant has, um, yeah, this is both her home and it is her business. She has a lodging business. She hasn't paid a cent to the this mortgage since January of 2014, but has derived seven years of income from multiple um, residences. Nevertheless, the evidence before the court on her affidavit is that um, she is a poor person and that she should be relieved from the obligation to pay this court's costs and the bank's security for costs in the sum of $5,000, which the court will um, appreciate uh, is a fraction of the costs which have been incurred because of the way this appeal has been conducted. It's of some concern to the respondent to then find, then here today for the first time, that actually the appellant's counsel um, if, if you're minded to not restore the appeal, that the appellant should be um, given permission to pay the security for costs within 24 hours, and then the appellant's counsel then volunteers that he would meet that cost. Well, he the, appellant is either, the hearing is recorded. The appellant is either poor or she is not, and the respondent is concerned that she is not poor if her counsel is, is happy to advance the costs for security for costs or the transcript but merely doesn't wish to do so until the appellant has, has dragged this through, through what is really a considerable motion practice. So, my lords, my, my submission in closing is that um, this appeal should has been dismissed. It should not be restored pursuant to Order 2, Rule 17. There is no good and sufficient cause to do so. Additionally, um, even if you were against me on that, the poor person's application should not be granted. One reason, the final point, I will make is that um, the appellate procedure um, really only commenced once the uh, the date for the um, the appellant to give vacant possession of her property approached. Um, it, it seems to me that there is no reasonable probability of success here. This appeal, in the haphazard way that it's being conducted, um, is really designed to to delay. Uh, or to frustrate the Chief Justice's order. And unless I can uh, assist the court any further, those are my submissions. Uh, well, there may be, I'm afraid, some ways in which you can assist. Um, if the question was um, whether or not she should be allowed to appeal as a poor person, um, it would be necessary to show that there was uh, a reasonable probability of success. Um, if, however, we came to the conclusion that she is not shown to be a poor person, then um, the question as to whether or not she had a reasonable probability of success um, in the context of Order 2, Rule 33 would not arise. Yes. But the question would then be uh, whether or not she had a good and sufficient cause um, so as to have the application restored uh, under uh, Order 2, Rule 17. Um, in fact, the question as to whether she has good and sufficient cause arises logically first, because until the appeal is restored, uh, there's nothing in relation to which to make a poor person um, order. Yes. I think you say that whether she is a poor person or not, um, the test, at any rate in the present context, of good and sufficient cause uh, under um, Order 2, Rule 17, uh, requires or entitles us uh, to refuse to restore the appeal absent uh, a reasonable probability of success. I may have conflated the two tests, my Lord. I don't think it's my, it's not my intention to do so. The, the provision of Order 2, Rule 17.4, 
gives this court um, expansive discretion to determine whether to restore an appeal. Yes. That, ex that expression, uh, that, that, that discretion is, of course, in the circumstances where an appeal has been dismissed because none of the orders were complied with. So I, I don't mean to conflate the Order 2 Rule 33 test with the Order 2 Rule 17.4 test. The, the way that I see it, as, you, as your Lordship rightly, um, rightly states, the, the first question is, um, should this court exercise its discretion to restore the appeal under seven, Order 2 Rule 17.4, taking yeah. into account all of the relevant facts and circumstances of this appeal and how it came about? If you were, uh, um, if were not with me on my primary submission that this appeal should absolutely not be restored, um, then the question would be, is she a poor person? And the two, two parts of that test, the, the primary one being, is there a reasonable probability of success? If we get to that stage and you then determined that she could not proceed, so you've restored the appeal, but she could not proceed as a poor person, um, you would then, I suppose, have to consider my friend's third notice of motion, which I, I believe seeks a, a variation or extension of time in which to comply with the directions order, um, which requires him, obviously, to, uh, the appellant to, um, to pr procure a transcript, to file proper submissions, to pay security. Um, you would then have to determine that notice of motion um, and only if, I guess there's, we're getting down the option, the decision-making tree, but I guess at that juncture, um, you could relieve the appellant um, of, of the procedural requirements, um, or you could require her to pay security for costs, um, and she may do so. However, um, that's really the only path forward that I see for the appellant, and my, as you expect my submission in the strongest possible terms is that the three hurdles that um, she would have to surmount um, uh, or so, so should not be so ordered in these circumstances. Right. Okay. Um, now just about three other matters. Um, somebody is going to find for us the order made um, in June 2020 about exchanging witness statements. I would, I would be happy to forward that to the court yeah. um, after this hearing. Do you know when that required the exchange? I do. Um, the exchange was due, I believe, on the 27th of February, 2020. Now, in the event- It might have been early, it might have been early March, but it was in that neck of the woods. Yes, my, my right. recollection is it was the end of um, February 2020. I took your lordships um, previously to an email that I had sent to the appellant's counsel on the 4th of March 2020, mm. a few days after the deadline. Mm. I said to the appellant's counsel, I have not heard from you for some time. We're required to exchange witness statements. Can you yeah. please confirm that you are ready to exchange? And we, that, that was an offer was never taken up. Um, so we were ready to respond. Sorry, have you shown us that email? Or is, um, I, I had. I think so. Um, it is at page 369 of the record. Yep. Yes. Oh, yes, you have. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Um, and do we know when uh, the appellant decided that she wasn't going to deliver any new statements and notified you? There, um, I can recall that there was some correspondence and a, um, a telephone conversation between counsel um, relatively late in the piece. My recollection, maybe my friend will correct me, but my recollection was that it was no more than a week before the trial where it became apparent, I was informed for the first time that the Appellant did not have the financial means to produce a witness statement and that it was instead proposed that she would rely on an affidavit that I recall dated back to perhaps 2016 or, or thereabouts. Um, the, to explain, the respondent's concern, um, justified or not, but the respondent's concern was that to lay out, so there was an order for evidence in chief to be exchanged by way of witness statement as is conventional. Is that the order made in January? 
in, in, yes, uh, which I will forward to the court yeah, after yeah. today's hearing. The, the respondent's concern was that um, it wished to lay out in proper detail for the judge the factual background to the dispute because it concerned 15 odd years of, um, of interactions. Um, that it was unwilling to show its factual hand to the appellant out of concern that the appellant might then um, change her position. And it was a concern about credibility that the Chief Justice observed in, in his ruling. So a decision was made um, to not provide the witness statement to the appellant until shortly before trial. Now, what I can, if it would assist the court, um, when I send the email with the order, I can also confirm the exact period of time in terms of days or hours <clears throat> um, before the trial when the witness statement was delivered to the appellant. I don't recall it being the eve of trial, as has been um, explained, but I can address it in an email to the court, copying my friend, of course, if it would assist. Well, I think I would like to know, speaking for myself, when before trial there was this telephone uh, conversation in which it was said that she had no financial means for a witness statement and would be relying upon an earlier statement. I can, that's the it was reduced in, um, sorry to interrupt my Lord, it was, it was reduced to a, um, I recall that I reduced it to an email. Right. And, and what I will do is I will speak with my learned friend and seek his consent to providing that email to the court and that should settle the matter. Well, so please um, produce um, that email uh, and then, having produced that email, um, which it would seem to me would be the trigger for the production of your witness statement, uh, tell us when it was that you in fact produced the witness statement to which the ATA was exhibited. Yes, my lord. I will, my lord. Thank you. And that's, those are the sole questions that I have. I don't thank know you. whether my, my colleagues have any. No, thank you. Not for me, no. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hill, anything in reply? Just a, a very briefly, I, I, would, I would say that the, the, the question isn't really one of defrauding the depositors. The, there may be a number of commercial reasons why Clarion would pay the depositors of one of its subsidiaries as, as things went along. The question might arise, had there been, for example, another shock to the financial system which caused a run or, or some kind of issue um, with the depositors showing up and rather than rolling over their deposits, um, seeking, at that point, they'd have been able to rub their hands and say, that's not, it, it, it wasn't me, it was a, a big boy and he ran away. So they never, in fact, well, they, they would appear, there was no evidence led. They, they, have, they have not to date, as far as we can see or understand, said to a depositor, you can't have your money back. That doesn't mean they can't say it, should the need arise and should there be a financial shock that requires them to do so. They don't need to defraud, it doesn't need to be an attempt to defraud anybody, it's just the possibility that they can walk away if it's commercially advantageous to do so. The reading of you Mr Hill, you're, you're seriously putting that forward as a, a possibility this number of years after the event? Well, this number of years after the event, changes the view that we have of it, but it doesn't change the intent of the parties at the time. Well, my point being, it hasn't happened so far, and, and yet approaching the 10-year anniversary, you say there's still a genuine concern that it might happen. Well, firstly, I can say we don't know whether it's happened and what's happened because there's no evidence. No, and It's not no. sufficiently notorious for us to say that the judges can take judicial notice that it hasn't happened. Se secondly, the fact that it hasn't happened now doesn't mean that it won't happen in the future. Well, that, that, have you said year, that. People have 30-year deposits, 30-year mortgages, and so on. The idea of clause... 30-year deposits aren't very common in Bermuda, are they? Pardon? 30-year deposits? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Sorry, sorry I wouldn't make one. I, I, I don't know, but I, I wouldn't make one, but that doesn't mean that other people might might not. The bank would certainly offer I never one. heard of <laughs> Right. No, I, I, I'm certainly not familiar with it happening. If it happens, it must be very rare in a, in a private context. If you wanted a 30-year note, you'd take it from the, from the Treasury. 
but the that's not the point. The point is that it might be an open book to them to say, we can't, um, right. we we will cast aside our subsidiary, and um, just simply allow it to be wound up in any in the way that it, it needs to be, uh, with no no consequences for the for the mothership. That hasn't happened so far. I I, I, I must concede, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. Well, how, how can it how can it happen now, bearing in mind, according to Mr. McCoska, um, all, both assets and liabilities have been taken off the balance sheet of the subsidiary and subsumed into the balance sheet of the parent. Well, let's 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 look at that. Let's say that all of the former depositors of FBG wanted all their money back, and that that had an enormous consequence for Clarion as it now exists today then the customers of Clarion would find themselves in difficulty solely uh, on the basis of, of this transaction, which didn't have the effect of transferring the deposits. I, I find this so speculative that I, I don't see how one is supposed to pay attention to it. Ten years ago, I'm, I'm a depositor with FBG. The amalgamation takes place, and then in 2021... Um, I, I decide I want my deposit back and capital G now Clarion says it's not going to give it to me for some reason best known to itself. Right. Well, we don't, well, well I mean, the, the uh, evidence is important, right? And, well, and there was no evidence. We don't have any evidence about, we don't have any evidence about what's been happening behind the scenes. And, we don't have any we evidence. Your, We've heard what Mr. McCosker says on take your word for the possibility. Well, the possibility, we've seen the possibility. If it, it hasn't happened in 10 years, we, we might be entitled to infer it's not going to happen now. But that doesn't change anything about the legality when the deal was made. We're not talking That's about what we're that. considering. No, if, the no, deal was illegal, would... if the deal was illegal or immoral on day one, I then would... it's illegal and immoral no, now, really whatever its consequences. Point. Pardon, my lord? I said you've moved on to a different point. Uh, no, it's the same point, by the way. If we're discussing the legality of the deal, it's to be examined on the day that it was... No, I was, I was talking about the probability that the parent, 10 years after the amalgamation, is not going to honour um, the deposit to one of its depositors. No more, no less. I have no information on what that probability is, and, and neither does the court. None was adduced. I beg your pardon. That None was, was adduced. There was no, nothing was, was adduced. Nothing was adduced about the probability of this default. Right. But if, if I mean, we could work it out if, if, if necessary. It's a, it's a matter of probability of mathematics, but that wasn't the point. It was never a point at all. Um, I'm not following it's the not words, a like a question. Mr. Hill, with the greatest respect, it's not a mathematical probability. We, we can look at events and we can speculate, and, and that's the end of it. Well, that's a mathematical Any further points, um, Mr. Hill? No, I, th I think I'll leave it there. Um, uh, I, I think the construction which I advance for this agreement is the only sensible construction that can be given to it. I've given a reason why that might be so why it might have been done that way, uh, whether or not it was required is another question. The suggestion that this document wasn't relevant at the beginning is, um, is simply wrong. It was, it's been relevant from day one. And when they knew they were gonna rely on it, it should have been provided to my client to do what she would with it at the time, whether or not she was entitled to the witness statement. And that, those are her points. Right, and those there is a there is a reasonable probability that such a point, fully argued, can be made good. We no, certainly right. all take notice that this transaction was extremely badly assembled, and the if that has a consequence of um, if, if that means that collecting the sums due under the mortgage from my client is more difficult than it might have been, then so be it. But that, that doesn't mean that we can simply avoid all of the consequences of the significant and the multiple flaws that uh, this, this transaction evinces.
on their own yes. case, the, the on, on their own case, the assignment was defective. Right. Could you just help me on one last matter? I want to make sure I got this absolutely clear. Um, in um, September 2011, FBG um, had um, obviously uh, depositors and borrowers. Um, what I haven't quite followed um, is exactly whom in the years that follow um, the borrow borrowers paid, in other words, whose account, um, and exactly from whose account, those who had deposits in the bank received payment when they wanted it. I, I have no information. Well, I don't, I'm not interested in an explanation. I, I want to know what happened. I, I don't know what happened with the other depositors. My client continued well, what, to attempt to pay at FBG and, and into her account and was told that she couldn't. And she continued to maintain that uh, Clarion were not her mortgagee. And she kept asking, and, asking for evidence that that was the case. Well, the other she didn't make a payment know. after January 2014. Correct. Or was she told that she could pay into some other account? Uh, uh, she, she's behind me now and says no, but um, I, I, I do that on instructions. I, um, I, I it may assist my, my recollection from the hearing, which again is is why a transcript is helpful. This issue about inability, I, I seem to recall. I can't hear you, Mr. McCosker. I, I apologize, my lord. I seem to recall from the hearing, and it's, 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 as much as I can assist, that the the issue, the evidence at, at trial was that after January 2014, when the bank's records indicate that payments stopped. I recall that the appellant's evidence was that she tried to keep making payments but was unable. And there was a lengthy cross-examination on that point. And I recall that the ultimate answer given was that the reason why there's no evidence is because additional payments were made in cash. And as you can imagine, it was a, there was a lengthy cross-examination about it. I can't assist you anymore though, because we don't have a transcript. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, um, Council. Uh, we will take time to consider what conclusion we will reach and deliver a judgment as soon as is uh, realistically possible. I'm grateful, um, my lord. Grateful, thank you. Um, thank you, and we will retire to our own.